What we really need to see is whether or not the slowdown is intact. We're still seeing some lingering effects of the pandemic. We think that we are on that path to get to lower inflation by the end of the year. The hawks and the Fed are really going to focus in on the wage growth. It's going to be difficult to see rates coming down in that way that they did in the last 15 years. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Following the biggest one-week drop since March on the S&P 500, a live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience <coughs> worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brownwoods. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly positive to kick off the trading week. We are positive one-third of 1%. One TK going into CPI on Thursday, yeah. PPI on Friday. And that's right where I want to go, John. Inflation, I think, is the key dynamic here. And over the weekend, it was an odd weekend. And I really want to bring this up front and center. It's in the guys Bloomberg reports on bond prices up in China and yields down but into the inflation reports that we see later this week is this tinge of deflation to come on asset prices worldwide that was me for me the theme of the weekend was deflation beginning of deflationary worries into that key inflation report quite a ride in the bond market last week TK <coughs> this morning you'll tire again by seven basis points taking back some of the move from Friday session Tom lots of Fed speak out there in the mix as well over the weekend Governor Bauman teeing up maybe another interest rate hike at the Federal Reserve if Fed speaks just what it is it's going to go by the date of the jobs report I'm not sure you know cut, what do you think cut this way cut that way Kind of jobs report. A bit of tension, Tom. I think a yeah. bit of tension between the headline number, deceleration, wages, still pretty hot. A belief, yeah. I think, still, the narrative sticks, and Jeff Rosenberg at BlackRock talked about it, Lisa, that ultimately, where payrolls growth goes, wages will eventually follow. The Fed sits there and says, we hope. That's basically where we're at when you talk about Michelle Bowman. On the other, high, on the other hand, John Williams had an interview with Gina Smilak over at the New York Times, basically saying that potentially they could cut rates as soon as early of next year. So you have all of the polls. <coughs> Polls coming out with conflicting data, living a lot of leaving a lot of people on Wall Street just basically saying, we'll do what we want to do and we'll trade the way we want to trade. And that means yields incrementally higher. I, I agree. It's got that summer goofiness to it, if you, if you will. And, you know, we'll see it in bonds and equities. We'll monitor through the day. But going to this inflation report, which is clear the key data this week, internationally, there are these deflation tinges there. The FT with a private equity story. They're giving haircuts now in private equity. I'm sorry, that's that's a form of non-Fed, non-Bank of England deflation. Kashkari did a pretty good job at the start <coughs> of the year to set up the year ahead. He said the first phase of policy is to get interest rates up quickly. The second phase is to sit there and hold there for a while. I think we're in between two phases right now on the committee. You've got some officials still discussing going higher. Well, some officials, including Goolsby, going into the weekend discussing maybe the second phase. Let's have that conversation now. Let's talk about how long. Right. Is it how high still or is it shifted to how long? That's where we are at the moment, in between those two phases on the committee. And the Jackson Hole, the aerospace engineer Cash carries on the x-axis and he understands the importance of time affecting all these things we talk about. And if you extend out time, keep interest rates where they are, different things can happen. Let's get to the price action this Monday morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market slightly positive on the S&P 500. A lift here by 0.4%. <coughs> a lift in the bond market too for yields. Treasuries down, yields up by 7 or 8 basis points on a 10-year, 4.1%. Bit of euro weakness out there, Lisa. 109.68 on the euro against the dollar. And that's been a trend, this feeling that maybe Europe won't do as well relative to the US uh, as people had previously thought this year. 8.30 a.m. It sets up the Fed speak beyond Beautifully, because it has both poles of the Federal Reserve coming together at 8.30. Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman, both speaking. Raphael Bostic has been more dovish. Michelle Bowman has been more hawkish. I would love to have them have it out. I don't think it's that kind of event, but let's see. Today, a relatively uh, quiet earnings week. Only 33 companies are reporting uh, of the S&P. Today's reports include Tyson around 7 a.m. You also have Palantir Technologies, Paramount and on meat. What I find interesting, look at Palantir's shares. They're up 183% year to date. Tyson Foods, the chicken uh, manufacturer, down 9.3%. Beyond <coughs> Meat up 28%. This is a market of stocks. We try to come up with headline ideas, but this is a market of divergent stories that have very different fates. Beyond Meat, is it like the old AI? I mean, remember when Beyond Meat was everything? Oh, you're trying to we've come up with a broad from, theme. We've gone from 220 to 15 on Beyond Meat. 
I mean, you sent is, the new is, AI. Is no, it's your... part of the AI oh. uproar, like Beyond Meat. You long you know? vegans. Is that what that chart's about? I, I just, you know, I, I remember when Beyond Meat was out. When Beyond Meat was was like the rage. I was like, are you kidding me? Have you ever eaten it? I have not. It's actually it's supposed to not be gross. as healthy as regular meat. Very salty. <clears throat> yeah. I've had one before. I, you I, liked it? I had one. It tasted I had a like bite. there's a lot of sodium in that stuff. I've had some. We, we can move on um, to talk about that later, but I just want to mention this. Lastly, at 3 p.m., we get the U.S. consumer credit for the month of June. And this will be interesting because we've seen this bifurcation, auto loans coming down, mortgages coming down, credit card uh, outstanding debt increasing, increasing at a slower pace last month, but do we see that reaccelerate? and how long can consumers <coughs> continue to uh, really uh, keep spending unless they keep borrowing? Let's start the conversation this morning with Laurie Cavasina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, the headline in your most recent piece, due for a pause. Due for a pause. What does that mean, Laurie? So, look, I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking that Lori Calvacina is turning super bearish, but we don't like where we are, you know, sort of in the intermediate term. And we're seeing a couple things. Uh, we went, you know, every every few months, right, we make sure we publish an update on our targets, our price target for the S&P. A couple of my cross-asset models are deteriorating. They were improving back in May. So, in other words, the, the appeal of stocks relative to bonds is worsening. Um, and also, our sentiment model is really bothering us. Um, it's really back at one standard deviation above its long-term average. If you look at net bullishness on the AAII survey, typically you see, you know, kind of mid to low single-digit gains in the S&P over the next 12 months when that happens. And this just feels to me like a market while I think everything has been deserved in terms of what we've done so far, it just feels like this market needs to stop, pause, have a little moment of digestion and catch its breath. Okay, I like the analysis and the idea is you got to pull back to get the, you know, get the fear click in. And, you know, you know we've all done yeah. this and studied it. Can you just stay flat out or through the bear market? I, I never really subscribed to that thesis to begin with, with Tom. I, you know, I never liked this whole concept of we're in a bear market, therefore we have to do X. We're having a bear market rally. It's false. Don't believe it. Um, I just was never in that camp. I think we priced in a recession last October, and we've basically been having a plain old-fashioned recovery trade. And now we're yeah. seeing some of the things that were really telling us to hold your nose and buy at the beginning of the year. I go back to that right. sentiment model. is telling us we need to calm down for a little while. And ben Laidler over at eToro writes up on the Lord Calvacino world this morning. He talks about value, talks about what's out there away from seven chosen stocks as well. Color or shape the value of mid caps right now? So it's interesting, Tom. We, you know, we do a lot of work on small caps, but we've also been getting increasing questions on mid caps. In our big chart deck we published this morning, we actually added a mid cap section for the first time in quite some time. And it's a pretty similar story to small caps. Um, they tend to benefit when you're in recovery mode. Um, they've started to do that a little bit, but not as much as we would have expected. Um, the valuation story is pretty reasonable. If you look at the multiples versus history, the mid caps look very cheap versus the versus the mega caps right now. And if we get a recovery in 2024, there should be more upside there. So we do feel like similar to how we feel in small caps, we feel like that mid cap part of the market where large cap managers actually can gravitate down to, we feel like that's right for a catch up trade as well. Laurie, we're going to be speaking with Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley later in this morning, which I'm really looking forward to. He has a note out talking about the fiscal backdrop and how much of a variable that is with respect to stock performance. How does that factor into what you're expecting going into an election year, which tends to be tumultuous? So, you know, when we were going through this targeting, you know, kind of refresh last week, so we looked at one of our political test, which is just a, a simple election cycle test. And one of the things we noticed is that the current year that we're in tends to be one of the strongest for the markets. So it's been, you know, kind of one of the, the you know, more positive signals. And next year, the election year itself or a presidential year tends to be one of the weaker years in the election cycle. And I just juxtapose that with what I've been hearing from investors. They keep asking me, well, when are people going to start paying attention to the election? There are a lot of questions that are starting to come up. And my response to the investors I'm speaking with is, I think it's starting now because you're all asking me about it. And it seems to me that this is emerging as just a very, very big source of uncertainty as to what is going to happen with the election next year, both in terms of the presidential race and Congress. So then what is the election cycle playbook? What is how you play this particular type of uncertainty versus the uncertainty of where we are in the inflation cycle and the Federal Reserve? 
Well, I think there's a lot of you know questions that are starting to emerge about the outcome. One of the things I'm hearing from investors are, you know, they're trying to probe whether or not there are alternatives to Biden. I'm hearing a lot of questions about that from international investors in particular. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of head scratching over what's going on, going on on the Republican side, especially with DeSantis. Um, there was some excitement there early on. Now that seems to have faded a bit. But I think this is just really an air pocket of uncertainty that's starting to emerge. We're not even really having detailed conversation with clients yet about what either side would want to do policy measures. It's really, you know, I think just frankly, this overhang of not knowing what the outcome is going to be that could push investors to the sidelines for a little bit. And I think that's going to weigh heavily once we get to the fourth quarter, when everyone starts putting their outlook discussions out, right? They're going to be talking about Fed cuts in the back half of the year, but they're also going to be talking about the election. So we, we kind of see those have, things starting to come into the conversation. We have more outlooks to come. Oh, joy. Well, some of those <laughs> outlooks are being revised pretty quickly. The recession calls on Wall Street dropping like flies, TK. Mike Gapen yeah. in the last week. Mike Faroli, JP Morgan going into the weekend, dropping his recession call too. Can you see Calvacina on the deck with a fam working on her outlook, gin and tonic on the table next to her? In the summer? Getting through the August. The mid-year outlook? The summer, the mid-year. The mid-year no, outlook. No, the, the mid like the summer, The summertime. The, mid, the summer adjustment. The summertime outlook. <laughs> Laurie, can I finish on a single name? Forgive me. What does it say about the market when the biggest weighting on the S&P 500 has had three quarters of declining sales, trades at 30 times earnings, and is up 40% year to date? What can you take away from that? What's the signal you take from that? One of the reasons why I think people have been gravitating towards these mega cap growth stocks is that we are in recovery mode and the shape of that recovery doesn't look so fantastic. I think the price we're going to pay for a short, shallow or skipped recession is subpar economic growth for a few years. And if you look at consensus forecasts as tracked by Bloomberg, um, basically for next year and 2025, GDP is expected to be in kind of that zero to two percent range. Well, guess what? Growth stocks typically do well when economic growth is scarce. And I think that's one of the reasons why people have been just plowing so much money into these big mega cap names because despite some of the near-term challenges they have faith that the longer-term growth opportunities are still there laurie thank you laurie cavacina of rbc on some of the tech stories so far this year tk can you still call <coughs> apple a growth stock when there oh, is no growth we, we don't have the length of the show to answer that it question. can be a theme for the week ahead is is, is well i mean they did terrible they, they just their, their earnings were just terrible. Biggest one day did loss of the year the on Friday. Generation? Okay, they, I don't have the numbers in front of me. They did like 26 gajillion and they spent 23 gajillion sending it back to shareholders. This and is your is, world. Are you describing a value stock or a growth stock? I think you're you're it's both is is to be honest. It's both. And that's the attraction of some of these uh, companies. What I would say is it's growth. And this is the key thing. And this is the CFA wonkiness is where do you set your terminal value? The stocks that Lori Calvacina is looking at have a three-year, five-year study. How can you do a three-year study on Apple? It's got to be seven years, eight years. Apple for 10 years, you know, and, and yeah. other names as well. well. I'm not saying buy Apple. My favorite part of the analysis with <clears throat> Apple had to do with their cash pile generating cash. Exactly. Because we actually have interest rates now and how that actually is a net positive to their bottom line and top line all around because they're earning 5% or whatever on, you know, the size of cash. What is it? The size of the Swiss economy or something? I mean, it's massive. And so you start looking no, at this kind of thing. There's a bar chart on Twitter this morning. Excuse me. There's a bar chart on X this morning, which shows Apple services and the revenues of like Spotify, Master card and the rest just the services part it, you know we, we we equate spotify with apple which is garbage that is i'm real just big asking mistake. questions look i can earn five percent <clears throat> cash do i want to give that cash to a company that's trading at 30 times earnings i that's the question i think a lot of people have got to ask themselves they were asking it on friday you mentioned the platform formerly known as twitter Elon Musk over the weekend said the Zuck versus Musk fight will be live streamed oh, on X. All proceeds will go to charity for veterans. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, do you see what he wrote back on threads? No, yeah. I'm, I shouldn't sorry, we use Mrs. a more reliable platform that can actually raise money for charity. <laughs> well, and then you heard uh, Elon Musk say he might need Brutal. surgery. I mean, come on. This is just ridiculous. The whole thing's ridiculous. Mike Wilson, not ridiculous. That conversation Although in a couple of hours' as, time. Wilson is just as cut. You think he wants a cage fight? Like, yeah, he, he is. Wants a cage fight. Who wins? He's like, you know. Have to find some equity ball, Tom. Yeah. John Stelfus, Mike Wilson. The American people deserve to know that President Trump, you know, asked me to put him over 
my oath to the Constitution, but I kept my oath and I always will. And I'm running for president in part because I think anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. I have no plans to testify, but uh, look, we'll, we'll, always, we'll always comply with the law. But look, I, I, I want to tell you, I, uh, I, I, I don't know what the path of this indictment will be. That was Mike Pence, the former vice president and 2024 presidential candidate, speaking to CNN over the weekend. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all as we kick off a brand new trading week. Your equity market on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Positive by 0.3% on a four-day losing streak and following the biggest one-week loss going all the way back to March on the S&P. Responsible for some of that volatility, that risk aversion, it was in the bond market. Yields up, up and away Monday through Thursday. They came back down on Friday and now they Spike higher again this morning by eight basis points on a 10 year TK 411.48. This from Anna Wong <coughs> of Bloomberg Economics. As everyone starts dropping their recession calls from the Fed staff to Mike Faroli to Mike Gapen of JP Morgan and Bank of America, respectfully, take a listen to this. If the recession we predict this year is delayed rather than averted and the Fed ultimately has to hike more than we currently anticipate, Anna Wong and the team finish with this line the most likely culprit will be Bidenomics. That's the take from Bloomberg Economics, TK, this morning. You know, let's remind ourselves, she has been absolutely dead on. When Anna Wong writes, you have to read it. And, and the answer here is, I need you to help me with what Bidenomics is, other than various forms of stimulus. And, it, you know, as I mentioned, the deflationary tone I'm looking at through August, part of that is, quote, unquote, fiscal tightening, which is out in the zeitgeist as well this morning. Is that fiscal tightening in the zeitgeist <clears throat> right now or is it on the horizon into next on year? On the horizon, yeah. yeah. I would argue that maybe some people would say that it's not on the horizon, which is part of the reason why they might see the Fed having to come in and do something more, which is the reason why we heard that from Mike Wilson. And uh, it would speak to the Treasury supply that we had in the last week, Tom, and the yeah. indication there is a lot more to come. Uh, what I would look at is, is there a road in Manhattan that's not being ripped up to be repaved? Is I there mean, a road in Manhattan that shouldn't be ri ripped up and yeah. paved? Yeah, like, for those of you that, that don't might, know that this, easier, the, the, streets, you know one. the streets of New York are like you're driving on a country road and name your third world country. I was walking I mean, through Soho. Amazing. They're doing the same street that they've been doing for three years. <laughs> three years. I almost stopped and asked them at the weekend. My, yeah, my favorite is when you go to any other place, it says bump ahead <laughs> of like whatever, and there's a little bump. They just have a big sign in New York City that says bump ahead. Bump. Boom, 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 boom. I have a turn just like that. There's a turn I do on Park Avenue. They've been working on that turn literally for three exactly. years. Exactly. Without What's going exaggeration. On? Ask Greg Fallier. There's your fiscal report for this morning from Manhattan. We welcome all of you across this nation to California and worldwide as well. Joining us, Yeoman's Duty from California this morning, Gregory Vallier, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. There it was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, Greg. Tammy Haddad was throwing her party, and off to the side was the governor of California, smooth, elegant, doing his Hollywood finesse. He's supposed to have a debate with the governor of Florida, who even his supporters say is not smooth and not finesse. What would a Newsom DeSantis debate look like, and should we care? I, I think it might be stopped in a TKO uh, fairly early. Uh, Newsom is awfully slick. He's the ultimate smooth politician, best hair in politics, and, and I think he'd have a pretty easy time. I mean, the, the dissent by uh, DeSantis continues with things that he has said. He's upset Floridians by not taking on insurance companies in Florida. I, I mean, I think the issue is soon going to be who's second. I'm not sure it's going to be DeSantis for much longer. I understand that an incumbent president always has priority, but the people like the governor of California, are they lined up in waiting, including the vice president, I should say? I think, Tom, that uh, Gavin Newsom is itching to run. Uh, he's got some baggage, like all politicians. He's maybe too far to the left for the American public to uh, embrace, but he's really good. He's very articulate. He's charismatic. And I do think he's going to be a big player. It's still too early to say Joe Biden is not going to run, but I just don't sense any enthusiasm when I travel around the country for a, a second Joe Biden term. Bidenomics has become a, uh, a, a, a negative almost. It's like Edsel or Malays. I mean, there are certain words that you don't want to have attached to you, and Bidenomics right. is not helping Joe Biden. Greg, 
the percentage of people watching and listening that know what Edsel is. I mean, we're down, we're down <laughs> minuscule. Lisa, pick it up. That was a car from a few years ago. Thank you, Tom. Fair I point. Guess, uh, there is a question as you talk about Bidenomics, how we pivot in a new era. Is it going to be fiscal restraint? Is it going to be fiscal uh, expenditures that just prolong a cycle, perhaps at the expense of higher inflation? Well, I think the American voters are still spooked out by inflation, and Bidenomics is not helping at all. I would argue that the big story domestically this fall is going to be increasing fiscal austerity. Uh, Kevin McCarthy's got to come up with a, a real trick to get the House to vote for a, a tight budget, even on defense. And I do think that the American voters associate spending with inflation. Meanwhile, we have this story uh, on the Bloomberg this morning about the potential for another government shutdown with yep. the Fitch rating downgrade really emboldening people who are more on the fiscal hawk side to really push for some of those spending cuts. Do you anticipate that type of drama heading into the end of the year? Yeah, I do, Lisa. I, I think you know, Fitch has two big problems. One is that we're dysfunctional in Washington on spending. Well, that's not going to get any better. It might get worse. The second big problem is that we're politically unstable. That's not going to get better. That could get worse. So on the two key issues that upsets Fitch, things don't look good at all. Given that, how much do bond vigilantes scare the Jesus out of people in Washington, D.C. right now when they take a look at the idea that their interest expenses are climbing rapidly and people are actually truly pushing back in a way that they haven't for years? Well, you you would think that this would start to really affect Washington, but I think the bond vigilantes and concern on rates is not going to lead to any big policy change anytime soon. We've got to wait until mid-September, then things are going to get very, very active. And I do think a government shutdown, either on October 1 or in December, is a better than 50 percent chance. I'm asking the same question at the moment with regards to the debate later on this month, Greg. Any updates there? Is the former president attending or not? I think he has to. I mean, he loves the, the limelight. I'd be surprised if he didn't. People would say he, he's chicken. But again, this is just a fight for number two, maybe a fight for the vice presidential nomination. I mean, Trump has is, is got a close to a 40-point lead on all the other Republicans. It's awfully hard to see that lead evaporate. Greg, good to start the week with you. And good morning okay. to you, Greg. Thank you, sir. Greg Vallier of AGF Investments. Is that debate confirmed, Tom? Newsom DeSantis. Is that happening? No. The way I read it, it's not. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe the desk uh, here uh, knows that. But I believe it is not confirmed as well. OK. Our desk has not informed me. Interesting. I went to them this morning. What would the value be in that for Governor DeSantis? Why would he want to engage with the governor of California when he's got a presidential To race? his core audience. He wants to... He, 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 Gavin Newsom, to translate this, folks, Gavin Newsom represents woke. All that the governor of Florida has is a philosophy on woke. So if he debates woke, take it from there. It was reported last week that Governor DeSantis, I believe on Thursday, did agree to a long-standing yeah. offer by Governor Newsom to debate. And I think that is, I think you highlight the right point, especially education, especially some of the other policies. Ron DeSantis wants to come out as firmly opposed to all of that, and that might be a good talking point for him. And Governor Newsom sees it as a way to really yeah. uh, expand on the on the global stage. My, my only thing is to agree with Mr. Vallier. I mean, the hair at the White House dinner when I saw Governor Newsom, the hair was... You're impressed by that, were you? The hair just, you know, the hair just... Did you ever catch the interview between away. Sean Hannity of Fox News and Governor Newsom? No. Hannity's a tough interviewer, and Newsom yeah. did a pretty, pretty decent job. Yeah. Pretty decent job. So if I was Governor DeSantis, I'd go over that and have a look at some of what those talking points might have been and how he responded to them. Yeah. Coming up shortly, Vasily Serebrikov of UBS on what's developing in this market at the moment. It's been a big move in the past week or so. Bonds down, yields up for Treasuries Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then on Friday, just snap back. Yields aggressively lower following the jobs report on Friday. Looking at the bond market this morning, up eight basis points on a 10-year to 4.11. You can call it 4.12. On a two-year, up eight basis points to about 4.85. And in the equity market, trying to bounce back from a four-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Apple trying to do the same. Biggest one-day drop on Friday of the year so far. Equity futures up a quarter of 1% from New York. Good morning.
It's a slow start to the week. It should pick up towards the back end with inflation data on Thursday, CPI, then PPI data on Friday. Going into all of that, your equity market with a little bit of a lift on the S&P 500 up by 0.2%. Coming off the back of a four-day losing streak, that daily losing streak, the longest going back to something like May. In the Nasdaq, positive by a third of 1% this morning, both the S&P and the Nasdaq experiencing their worst week since March last week. In the bond market, the two-year, 10-year, 30-year yield higher this morning by eight basis points at the front end, 485 on a 10-year by eight basis points. So let's call it about 411, 412. Tom, all over the place last week, yields higher, yeah. aggressively lower in Friday's session, and we snapped back once again this morning. But a reset, you look at the spread market. We had the headline out moments ago on Germany, the 30-year bond in Germany has a yield back to 2000, I believe, 14. And you know, the answer is we're migrating back there. On, on you, you go out 10 years, you go out 20 years, and we're, re, we're literally repricing. My criticism is we look at yield, yield, yield. I look at price. What it means is price down. Price down. That's what, that's up. a hard Let's hard migrate from bonds to foreign exchange <laughs> just quickly. In FX right now, in G10, the dollar stronger against absolutely everything, including against the euro. It's a break of 110 once again over the last few days. 109 to 71. <clears throat> We're negative here, Lisa, by let's call it 0.3 percent on that currency pair. This comes as a lot of people talk about possibly the end of the rate hiking cycle, both in the U.S. and Europe. Surprisingly, in Europe, when every single person you talked to in London earlier this year, every single person yep. said the ECB was going to go further than the Fed so, uh, in 2023. OK, what now? How do you rearrange all of those wagers on the heels of something that looks very different from that? And European growth has disappointed in a huge way. And the upside surprises have come from, guess where, not Europe, from the United States. Under surveillance this morning, plenty of Fed speak through the week going into CPI on Thursday. Governor Bowman speaking over the weekend indicating, quote, here is the quote, additional rate increases will likely be needed to get inflation on a path down to the FOMC's 2% target. There is a range of views, Tom, on the FOMC. That is one. Others believe maybe we're done here and we should talk about the length of time <coughs> spent at 5.5% interest rates at the Federal Reserve, Goolsby being one of them. And I think Bostick indicating also, speaking to David Weston going into the weekend, Tom, that ultimately that period of time, once we get to that peak rate, will be a long time. We'll be sitting there for a while I, waiting for inflation to come back down. I'm going to go back to the heritage, John, of what we did with Bloomberg surveillance. Who's giving you the message? Who are these people? Where do they come from? What's their pedigree, et cetera? Goolsby is the real deal. Thank you, Milton Academy, for the note out on Twitter. It came out of superb academics at Milton Academy, bulletproof PhD economics over to Chicago, arguably our best microeconomic foundation, on and on, Bostic, uh, the same way. Bowman was an intern for Bob Dole. And she's a George Bush acolyte. She's an attorney. That statement she did is, you know, it's boilerplate. It could be written by any number of PhDs there. But you got to know who's talking who. Bostic, you really lean forward and listen to. She's got a vote on the committee, doesn't she? I, it's worth listening to. Not alone, I don't think, either, Tom. I, I, Based I on think, the projections oh, no, on the, the view, FOMC, the some view, people think there might be yeah, more than one Yeah, there's no question about that, that the view is there. No question about Lisa, that. Lisa, you got things to say? I've got lots of things to say. I'll just say this. A lot of people with PhDs in economics have gotten it wrong also. Nobody's got it right. That's all I'll say. OK. Tell us what you really think, TK. Elsewhere, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking to Bloomberg, saying he won't pursue the entire judicial overhaul originally planned by his government. I hope that we don't get into a constitutional crisis. I think we won't. I think there's a way of uh, reaching uh, an equitable compromise, which is what I'm trying to do. Netanyahu said his government was now working only to change the makeup of the judge selection committee. At least you wonder how much some of the market turmoil in more recent weeks had to do with, can we call this backtracking? It feels like backtracking to me. He also said, we want smart money. We want all of your money invested in, the, in, in Israel. It's good. What's interesting to me is he's not doing a media <clears throat> tour in Israeli media. He's doing an, in, a media tour in international media. And this is something not lost on the many uh, Israeli journalists. Uh -huh. There is a question, yes, is he backtracking? Yes, is he trying to make Israel sound more amenable to money coming in at a time of incredible political friction, even if he just isolated this to this change? To me, and I'm speaking completely outside my remit here, the fact is he's 73, which is sort of pretty younger. But at the same time, is this a generational divide in Israel where he represents the people that he respected, Ariel Sharon and the others, and there's a younger generation of Israel that's just walking away from the 
dialogue. Great exchange with Francine Lacroix yeah. over the weekend. You can find the full exchange <coughs> on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. I suggest you take a look at the longer extended interview of that. What we'll a turn to this from HSBC's Head of Public Affairs. Sherrod Kalpakol saying this. He's said to have told attendants at a closed-door event in London back in June that the UK would often bow to the demand of Washington. He accused the British government of being weak when it comes to China. Kalpa Bowles said in a statement to Bloomberg that his personal comments did not reflect the views of HSBC. Um, Lisa, maybe a little bit ironic to come from HSBC, you which, think? when it comes to China, might be accused of being weak itself on certain issues in foreign relations. When I was reading the story yesterday, I was thinking to myself, this is going to fly very poorly because it just edifies this feeling that HSBC ignores the status quo of the Western world and tries to go off and lure business from China. It comes at the same time over the weekend. Did you read about this, that Chinese authorities are pressuring top economists to not be too negative on their economic outlooks for China? So it raises a lot of questions well, about some of the outlooks and things like that The story is old as time, that is. Yeah, well, I mean, but this is <laughs> Yeah, but it comes out at a time of some serious know, concern. So, you know, you just start to think about alliance. It's uh, interesting. When you grew up in England, was HSBC a British bank or were they those Asian guys that were in Britain? I mean, what was that, that image? No, I think we considered that a British bank. It was a British bank. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I, to me, I, 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 I always feel incredibly foreign debating about it, you I, know, uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai and the rest. I mean, I, don't, I just I don't know where they fit in right now. I just think it's interesting because this is an increasing debate. Does the rest of the world go along with the U.S.? How clean are these fissures well, between you know, China versus the U.S. and who has to align with who? And you've seen that with Emmanuel and Macron. In a perfect world, yeah. multinationals sit on the fence. Yep. Can they sit on the fence anymore? Uh, politically, maybe they can or maybe they're not. But the, I would say it's hugely dynamic right now. Witness the import dynamics of China, where Mexico is, is becoming far more dominant only because China is becoming less so. Uh, right now on Foreign Exchange, Vasily Sarbakov joins us now, macro strategist and on Foreign Exchange at UBS as well. Vasily, what we see is a strong dollar, but I really don't see it on a blended index. I see a stable dollar. Is it a stronger dollar forward or a stable dollar forward? Well, we think it's actually a weaker dollar forward uh, from from here. Uh, I think the FX market is in kind of a tough spot at the moment in the sense that it's difficult to really navigate a lot of these cross currents. Um, as you were saying previously on the program, you know, it seems like the U.S. economy is outperforming, uh, but at the same time, it seems like we're getting to the end of the Fed tightening cycle. So which which way do we go? In our view, the end of the tightening cycle actually dominates, and that's what you've seen in the past six Fed cycles. Whenever the Fed stops hiking and starts transitioning to a pause and then eventually rate cuts, the dollar tends to weaken, and usually because front-end yields in the U.S. fall. Um, it's a, it's, it has been somewhat of a messy transition, I would say, and that's still uncertain and very much data-dependent, but I think that's uh, kind of where we're going ultimately. To a stronger euro 115 or a far more stronger yen, and folks, the, over the weekend, the economists redid the Big Mac index to show how absolutely unique the Japanese yen uh, is. Do you look at those moves as leading to instability or less so? I don't think this is, you know, leading to any particular instability, but it is largely a function of, I think, what happens to U.S. monetary policy rather than happens to the rest of the world. So I think that the, you know, the the, the argument here is not that Europe or China are going to reaccelerate particularly. I think the argument here is that U.S. monetary policy is turning uh, more and more restrictive, as I think Chair Powell pointed out in the last press conference, right, with inflation coming down. And we think we're going to see more evidence of that this week. Real rates are getting more and more restrictive. And ultimately, that means that the growth numbers are going to follow as well. And that's when the Fed starts to pivot. Now, I think the difficulty and sort of where the upside risk for the dollar is, is, is really risk sentiment, right? And we've seen that past week when S&P didn't have a great week on the back of high yields uh, on the long end. Um, but ultimately, you know, if the Fed has the ability to start pivoting uh, towards the end of the year, that's the, the dominant driver for the FX market that probably outweighs 
um, any sort of wobbles in, in, in equities that we might see. Vasily, you said that typically the dollar weakens when the Fed pauses or reaches the end of their tightening cycle. But what happens if everybody else also is reaching the end of their rate hiking cycle at the same time? In other words, who does the dollar weaken against if Europe also might be reaching the end of the rate hiking cycle? Yeah, no, I think th I think that's kind of a, a, a great question, and um, that's probably where you know a lot of uh, sort of divided opinion is in the FX market at the moment. Generally, you know what we've seen is th the Fed tends to dominate all other central banks in terms of the driver when it pivots, just because of the importance of uh, sort of U.S. rates. It is also true that compared to say the ECB, the Fed has a dual mandate, and I think the argument here is that. If inflation is under control, which is still a big if, but we're going to see next week and then before the September FOMC meeting, there's another CPI report. But if inflation is under control, then the head sort of has more room to react to any growth uh, weakness. And in fact, it's going to be faster at doing that than the ECB, which is much more just squarely focused on inflation, wages and inflation projections. So in that sense, at some point, the dual mandate sort of kicks in vis-a-vis -vis some of those other central banks that are more uh, squarely, so to speak, focused on inflation. How much would potential dollar weakening stem also from what we saw at a Fitch last week and this fear around ongoing incurrence of debt, even at a time where the unemployment rate is so low in the U.S.? Yeah, that's actually been kind of a tough way to trade the dollar. And even going back to 2011, right when S&P downgraded the U.S., we saw some strength in the Japanese yen, but the dollar actually did fairly well. Um, at the time. So it, it's that's that's a harder read, I think, mainly because the long end of the curve is less important for currencies anyway. And as we've said, equities might react negatively. It tends to give the dollar a bit of a safe haven bid. Um, so I, it, it, it sort of works in the background. Yes, I think once if you if you ever get into a weaker dollar environment, then those uh, additional drivers uh, or or forces tend to um, kind of add to the dollar weakness, but we're not there at this point. So certainly, you know, if you're looking at the at the Fitch move last week, I wouldn't use that as a as a reason to sell the dollar. I'm not sure how many people are, to be honest, Vasily. Vasily Serebrikov of UPS. So many people pushing back against that being a catalyst for absolutely anything. To Lisa's point, you've got the ECB talking about maybe being done. There are some thoughts that perhaps the Bank of England is closer to that point, but that's going to remain to be seen based on the incoming information on the CPI front. The Federal Reserve, maybe there's 25, 50, there's a feeling they're almost done. Lisa, the rest of the world, emerging markets have started cutting. Chile, Brazil, there's a feeling that others follow too later in 2023. And then here's the question. Brazil's cutting to what? 13.75 percent. I mean, sure. it's, I mean, coming down uh, significantly to something that's also still significant. But you raise a great point. At what point does the carry trade not work anymore? Do some of these higher yielding currencies hold less luster and kind of really drive a shift back to developing market? It's such an I, interesting moment, right, where you're not seeing people go into those currencies as a result of this. It, it, right where, where we are now versus, say, the third week of December last year. Do we have any greater clarity than we did then? I don't think we do. I don't. We're farther on from the pandemic. I'll give sure. them that. We're farther on from a medical disaster. I guess there's some things we can believe in, like Barbie. But the bottom, the bottom line is, why do we have certitude now about the view to Q4 or Q1 of next year? I don't know where that. I just don't know where that comes from. I don't think we do. Veronica I, I Clark of City's going to join yes, us later, Tom. Yeah. And a team at City are anticipating that inflation starts to pick up again, going into the yeah. turn of the year and going into early 2024. That conversation worth a look. That coming up very shortly. Veronica Clark over at Citigroup, Tom. Looking forward to that conversation. It's going to be interesting to see. And let's remember, we've got to keep score about who actually got this right. And that gives us some faith in their belief for it. Anna Wong at Bloomberg, what Holland Horst and the team did at Citigroup. But I, I just think a large dose of humility is in order now as we try to get children to begin their summer I thought, reading. I thought you were about to call economists on Wall Street children. <laughs> no, then. no, no. As we no. try to get children to drop their recession year. calls. It's the time of <laughs> year. To get my child no. to when, drop his recession It's the time, at least it's the time of year where it's the piles there. Let's begin. It's a job report that has something for everybody. If you're in the softer landing camp, you will take comfort from it 
payroll gain of 187,000 below the 200,000 forecast and lower hourly work. If you're in the harder landing, you will worry about the 4.4% wage increase driven by 0.4 month on month. And you'll also worry about the low unemployment rate. The marketplace favors at the margin, the softer landing interpretation as of now. The brilliant Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge on Friday. Bottom line, there's always something to worry about. And there was plenty to worry about based on whatever you thought on all the economic data. Here, here. It's a Friday. That's how Bramo feels about most of the incoming information. <laughs> CPI later this week on Thursday, PPI on Friday, more inflationary reads in America at the back end of this week. Going into all of that, your equity market on the S&P 500, positive by 0.2%. Tom trying to bounce back from a four-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Bounce back. I don't think, do we think earnings here matter this week? I, I, I don't hear it. I mean, there's like you mentioned, Lisa, earlier, there's some earnings reports out there, but we're sort of beyond that, right? And then the second that you say that, there's going to be that one earnings report that crystallizes the fear in yeah. markets and unravels everything. So keep saying that. Okay. Company, no you know, one cares about Exactly. That. That's exactly it. Did you see I'm, what they said? Palantir, artificial intelligence is like, never going to happen. I've, what do they do? Exactly. I've never heard of that company. And then we're going to be talking yeah. about that for the next three weeks. I mean, I'm looking at a two-stand. Yellow's gone bankrupt. <laughs> well, that's no, a that's, big deal. I, I'm Emotionally with you. It's a big deal for, for 30,000 yeah. people that have lost their job, well, Tom. It, Does that give you a macro it, signal on the broader economy when the likes of Gapen's dropping their recession call? Oh, yeah. The Rowley's oh, yeah, done absolutely. the same thing. The Fed staff but are doing the same thing. Yellow is sort of like, you know, the Port of L.A., Port of Long Beach and all that. It has to do with the logistics of the nation. And to me, it's more than 30,000 people. It's, Especially, it's, it's, yeah. it's moving stuff around. Especially because FedEx pilots are now <clears throat> you know, looking I, organized. I, I'm looking at standard I'm going to throw this up on TV because we, good morning to radio worldwide. And the answer, John, is we're mid-trend on standard and Porsche 500. We've gone from plus two standard uh, deviation. I can give you the exact date on that, July 27. In over a week and a half, we've come right back down, smack dab on my long-term moving average. The damage, as Calvacina mentioned earlier, this damage, this pullback is completely normal. And, you know, we're trying to make some theater out of it. I don't see any theater on the screen. We're not trying to make theater out of anything. We've had massive year-to-date gains. Yeah. Tom, I brought up Apple, and for good reason. It's the biggest weighting on the <clears throat> S&P 500. It's had three quarters of negative sales growth, Tom. And Lisa, I would say if you're experiencing three quarters of softer sales growth, yet your stock is still up by 40% year to date and you're trading at a multiple of 30 times earnings, Got to ask some questions, haven't we? If you've got earnings that are actually the weakest, declining, the most going back to 2020 at the peak of the pandemic, on average, when you, you know, gloss over some of the others, you have to wonder. I have to say, Tom, you think that we're gloomy and doomy? I could go full gloom. This is not full gloom in I, any I, way, I, shape, or form. We know you need and no encouragement. Veronica will walk out of the room. <laughs> I'll just say, this like, is not extra drama, I will just say. Please, full gloom. Give us a tinge No, no, it's okay. Let's, let's move on. Okay. You're getting to our guests. I'm just I waiting for the it. full gloom. <laughs> Veronica Clark's going, what did I walk into? Economist at Citigroup, and they have not been full gloom. They've been looking for a higher interest rate regime and the idea that America will prosper throughout it. Let's go there. You guys taken a victory lap for the last six months. You've really been right about the resiliency of the American economy with high rates. Do you just assume within the Citigroup view that if we do have a new rate regime, a higher reset back before 2007, 2006, that we'll be fine? I don't know. I think we actually might be relatively gloomy now compared to some other people. You can be full gloom if you'd like. <laughs> we're, not, we're not full gloom, I would say. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not terribly optimistic that we will get this true soft landing. It might look that way for a couple months in the data. We'll obviously get CPI this week and that will look softer again. We had a very strong, still strong jobs report on Friday. Um, but I think we're really less optimistic that this will end well um, and that inflation will come back sustainably to 2% without some bigger downturn. Um, it just depends on when we get that. Um, we still think maybe first half of next year. Um, but yeah, the next six months could look pretty good. So to be clear here, you're calling for a recession still as this we is are. a weekend where other people are yeah. pulling back from that. Yeah, um, basically just the, the assumption that if we are getting inflation sustainably back to 2%, that has to happen with some kind of 
you know, contraction, something that we would call a recession. How much does your call really hinge on the fiscal impulse? How much Bidenomics continues to pump cash into the economy versus some sort of fiscal restraint sort of boogeyman out there that some people talk about? Yeah, we, we could be seeing some of that. I think it's some of the data we've seen this year. Um, obviously, we've had construction investment in manufacturing structures, you know, building new facilities um, that might be related to, to policies. It's just the general onshoring, reshoring after you know, pandemic disruptions of the last couple of years, I think we'd be skeptical that that will last too much longer. I think one thing that we learned from the debt ceiling debacle is that, you know, there's really not a ton of appetite for additional fiscal spending. It could be hard, especially as we're getting into an election year next year. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a long lasting trend. That said, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of appetite to make material cuts right now. Going forward, mm -hmm. how much does that underpin a call for higher yields, at least at the longer end of the yield curve over a longer period of time, given the potential for increased deficits yeah. and inflation that's not going to come down so much? Yeah, I think that's obviously a huge part of the move that we saw in longer end yields last week. Um, and yeah, there, there's not necessarily the, the appetite for additional fiscal spending, but I agree that you know even traditionally more fiscal conservatives are, are less inclined towards cuts. Um, and that yeah, that is definitely a factor keeping yields higher. For Can longer. we get a little bit deeper? Can you explain to everybody where you're seeing that fiscal stimulus lift the economy? What was it? Where's it working? Yeah, it's always really hard to know exactly what you know, we're seeing in GDP data, where it's coming from. Um, but we definitely have seen you know investment in manufacturing structures picking up over the last couple quarters. Maybe that's related to infrastructure chips act. Um, you know, you're seeing it some in, in public investment. You know the infrastructure spending that's now coming out. Um, but all of that, of course, is already legislated, and now we're starting to see that in the data. Maybe, um, but it's always really hard to know exactly how much we can attribute. Do you get a to sense it. that's based? on spending or is that just based on a shift in policy? The crowding in and getting people to spend here. It's at it's home. both. I'm I'm sure some of it is is direct and, and some of it is also probably you know incentives for for people who are reshoring onshoring um, and some of that probably would have happened even without government you know. Inter how much from what we got on Friday, the idea of a jobs number that could give you any story that you wanted, as we look ahead to CPI, how much are people looking at it or just shrugging it off as a potential head fake, mm -hmm. an inflation smile, as Mohammed Alarian calls it? Yeah, there really was something for, for everyone. I think the most you know interesting part of the, the jobs data that we've seen the last couple months is that we are getting this interesting pickup in wages again. We've had a couple months where average early earnings are, are printing 5% annualized, and that's Definitely stronger than they had been printing for you know earlier in this year. Um, other measures like the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, you know, that'll come out later this week, running from five to six percent. Um, so you're really you are still having a, a really tight labor market, mm -hmm. and and you can see job growth. You know, headline job <coughs> figures slowing just as you are running out of people to hire even. Um, so right. a combination of lower unemployment rate, strong wage growth, softer than expected jobs kind of looks like that supply issue again. Uh, too quickly here, but we'll I'm sure talk about it in the coming weeks. For the next six weeks, eight weeks, my clear number one data point is the 10-year real yield. And the answer is we've gone from a 1.50 up to 1.70, even 1.80. The history pre-crisis, pre-06, is about 2, 2.05. Where do you and Andrew Hollenhorst feel the 10-year real yield should set? Yeah, I don't. we don't have a, a specific forecast for that. I'll leave that to our rate strategy team. But, yeah, I mean, I think you can definitely see, you know, you're not going to get, you know, break-evens moving higher potentially. You know, we'll get some softer inflation data. Um, but, yes, you do still have, you know, supply issuance and this, you know, resetting of growth expectations. So you can still see real yields higher, you know. Veronica, that was the right answer. Thank you. That was Veronica a Clark complete non-answer. Of City. It was not gloomy. Leave though. it to the rate strategist, yeah. TK. Right. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. I wonder what she thinks. Uh -huh. If you want to make sure that you get on when you get back to work. Yeah. Bottom line, look, for City right now, Tom, is that it's going to look like for a soft landing until it doesn't. And it might look like one through the rest of summer and later on this year. But what does the real yield do? And that Maybe affects it everybody watching and listening. Without a doubt, Lisa. And that's going to be the debate. Not about what the data looks like this summer. It's like, what does it look like at the turn of the year into 2024? Yeah. And some of these other pressures, particularly wages, that are picking just to touch back up at the same time the oil prices are. I know that's causing a lot of heartburn down in Washington, D.C. Gasoline. Yeah, that's Gas what I'm prices. I saw mm. the chart you put out. Well, just, I'm, you know. it's, yeah, and this is causing serious heartburn in Washington, reports I follow say. Bramo on X over the weekend, <laughs> I can't known get, as I Twitter. Can't get on I can't, that. It doesn't work, I, does No. It? And did you notice that it's a repost now? It's not retweet? Yes. I saw I was that. Like, yeah. Yeah. So does like, that mean really? a tweet is a post? 
It's yeah. a post. It's, yeah. it's an X. It's, we we're now posting. <laughs> we're re-Xing. And we're reposting. If you have to explain it, there's a problem. I would agree with I, that. Yeah. No, you're right. No, it's, it's like a, Prince. A lot of explaining. Yeah. yeah, but Prince was worthy of it, you know? Well, he had a reason. It was an emotional yeah. reason. It wasn't just like, you know, the platform formerly known as Twitter. New phase of life. Yeah. Uh, something deeper and meaningful. A rebellion against the uh, what a record legend. labor. Yeah, what that a was, legend. was a legend. Cameron Dawson and New Edge Wealth joining us in the studio next from New York. Good morning. What we really need to see is whether or not the slowdown is intact. We're still seeing some lingering effects of the pandemic. We think that we are on that path to get to lower inflation by the end of the year. The hawks and the Fed are really going to focus in on the wage growth. It's going to be difficult to see rates coming down in that way that they did in the last 15 years. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Recession calls on Wall Street dropping like flies. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 just about positive by a quarter of 1%. We are light on earnings this week, heavy on data at the back end of the week with CPI on Thursday and PPI on Friday. But TK, the line getting longer. <clears throat> You've got the likes of Mike Gape and Bank of America yeah. dropping the recession call for Rowley over at J.P. Morgan into the weekend, dropping the recession call. This comes after Chairman Powell told us in the news conference a couple of weeks back that the Fed staff have also done, guess what, dropped their recession call. Who's left, Tom? We didn't talk about this in the last hour. Let's go to it right now. And, you know, to go to Jackson Hall here, and people are saying, what do you do with an NBER recession call, classically two-quarters of negative GDP? These people are reacting to the data, and the data can be summed in the Atlanta GDP now statistic, it moves, it changes around, it could change, it could get gloomy, it could get full gloom. It's possible <laughs> you could get full gloom Atlanta. But the fact is we don't. And the answer is we're out of 2.x or dare I say 3.x percent. That's not a recession. Unemployment right now, Lisa, 3.5 percent. That is also <clears throat> not a recession. Which is raising a question for why there is still the amount of debt that we have overhanging, why there is the fiscal spending, and what that will mean for inflation going forward. There still is a quagmire with some people basically saying, have faith. The employment rate is a lagging indicator. It will pick up the unemployment rate. And other people saying, no, you have to look at the data as it is. It shows strength and it shows higher inflation. And that's got to come into some of the yield calls that you have going forward. So one more pay Rolls print after this one, two more CPI prints between the last Fed meeting and the next one. Are we at the point now where this data has to tell the Fed too hike as opposed to tell them not to? Feels like we're at that point now and this data at the moment isn't screaming hike again. If you believe that you have to listen to each Fed official differently, then yes, I would say that that's the case because we had the New York Fed president, John Williams, speaking in an interview in the New York Times saying he sees the case to pause and really leading into that, talking about potential cuts early next year if the data confirms it. So at what point are they looking for excuses not to at a time when people say the data right now is not <clears throat> real time enough to actually give us a sense? Yeah. I mean, how many people are looking past the data in this newly de data dependency world? How can you look past the data? You can't. The, every central bank forever has been ex post. We're all ex post right now. That's not true. I don't know why you say that. That's not true. I, I hate to be a little bit snappy, but that's not true. I so was many, just waiting for What was the, the mistake coming out of the crisis? Were they ex post or ex ante? The, the mistake coming out of the crisis is they had to deal with a medical event and they clearly over accommodated for that medical event. Everyone did, including, say, big tech employment and the rest. What was the transitory call all about? That was a forecast. Yes, that was a forecast, was forecast based, based on a policy. set of medical cards they were handed. And okay. then things got better. And right. we'll settle this I remember one day. the day Ellen Zettner uh, changed her call on that. Ellen was very transitory, and she switched on a dime when the medical data began to show a recovery. We've got to switch on a dime to the markets right now. One sure. day we'll settle that debate, Tom. Equity futures on the S&P 500, positive by a quarter of 1%. Lisa shaking her head. You're tired by <laughs> seven basis this. points. 4.1% <laughs> on a 10-year. It's a full gloom brief. <laughs> this is going to be a really fun commercial break. 8.30 a.m., we get the Fed speak today. Uh, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic and Fed Governor Michelle Bowman, they are on the opposite sides of the ideological spectrum, which is pretty narrow right now, if granted. But it 
seems like Raphael Bostic is pushing toward a more dovish, let's pause, let's think about things, Michelle Bowman pushing a little bit more on the hiking type of narrative. Today, as John was saying, a bit of a pause, a bit of a quietness in the earnings front. 33 S&P companies reporting today. Of course, we're looking at Tyson Foods, which is uh, coming any minute, and as well as Palantir Technologies after the bell, Paramount and Beyond Meat. Palantir, everyone's focusing on the AI darling and whether the 183% gain can be justified. Beyond Meat, of course, is meme Palantir stock. a meme stock? Um, I don't know that that's exactly the case because they did come out with artificial okay. intelligence prognostications, but you can call anything a meme stock, I suppose, if you yeah, want to, Melina, on some yeah. level. But we also are looking at 3 p.m. U.S. consumer credit for the month of June. This is going to be interesting to me because of the shift that we're seeing away from term loans, auto loans, mortgages, uh, student loans, people not taking those out because they don't want to lock in these really high rates. But credit card debt, yes, let's go. And that seems to be what everyone's doing because they're spending more than they're earning, and that is what we're seeing consistently in the revolving credit. I'm wondering how long that can continue. I love it when you've got a rant. <laughs> I just absolutely love it. You just squeeze something in because there's something you want to say. Cameron well, Dawson joined us now, <clears throat> CIO of New Guilty. Edge Wealth. Cameron, good morning to you. Good morning. Now, the data is coming better than expected, but I'm trying to work out whether things are getting better truly. Are things improving or just better than expected? I think that, yes, it is better than expected. You can see that in economic surprises, but there are signs that certain parts of the economy are reaccelerating. Look at housing investment. It was down 15% from the 2022 peak, up 5% since April. Look at manufacturing. That is definitely bottoming. You're starting to see signs of that improving. And so I think that there's pockets where, yes, better than expected, but certainly signs of reacceleration, despite the fact that we have higher interest rates. Can you say the same thing about earnings? In America right now? No. No. What it's really interesting is that despite the fact that we have had economic surprises being positive, you've actually seen earnings estimates continue to get cut for 2023, and you're not seeing estimates move higher for 2024, which just points to the fact that though the bond market and though economists might have forecasted a recession, this equity market never priced in a recession into earnings. You mentioned scale and pricing power. Is that the great underestimated feature of a next leg of a bull market? Oh, most certainly. I mean, look at the pricing that we got out of consumer companies this quarter. It was up 8 9%. Look at Caterpillar raising prices 10 11% for its machines. Large companies have pricing power, and that means that they're able to pass on those higher prices to their customers. It's a question of if that continues, and I think that does remain a key question. We are seeing some give back in volume, but I think pricing power is what defines why large caps have outperformed small caps. So, very so, much. so help me with this. If, if you look at the margins down the income statement of some of these seven giant stocks or whatever, do they deserve in your mind a 28, a 30 multiple? Not really. I mean, if you look at Apple, Apple certainly has all of its expansion this year has been driven by multiple expansion. And yet its earnings have been flat to down. And all of the earnings have really come from financial engineering. Now, of course, there's an aspect of a safety trade to Apple trading at 30 times earnings. But I think that when we look at overall, it's not just the earnings outlook, but I think it's the interest rate outlook as well. We do know that there's long been a history of interest rates being tied at the hip of growth valuation. That relationship has completely broken down this year. When you walked in, it sounded like you'd been in the rain in a fishing boat for four days uh, trying to figure out whether or not you liked being in the outdoors. And that's because you were. You were at Camp Kotak. And I'm wondering, with all of the luminaries there, as they all talked about what to expect going forward, are they feeling more optimistic or less after all of the revisions and the changes to forecast that we've been seeing? Well, I think there was a looking around of saying, is this time different? Because we had the debt downgrade last week at the same time that yields started to climb. That's very different than 2011, where you had a debt downgrade, yields fell in a risk-off move. And I think we all looked around and said, we have 8.5% of deficit to GDP right now in a world where GDP is really strong. So what happens when GDP falls? Where does that deficit go? How much room is there for the bond market to absorb this higher issuance? And I think that's the eye-popping thing from last week is that we all looked around, looked in the mirror and said, oh, wow, yields could actually move higher, given the fact that the bond market is so confident that they would move lower. This is really important. Are you saying that in some ways this was a sea change in terms of uh, really projecting out higher long-term yields? than most people had previously thought. 
I think it's very much a possibility, given the fact that the bond market has been so incredibly confident that the Fed would get inflation rather quickly down to its 2% target. Look at inflation break-evens. They never blew out during this entire inflation episode, which just reflects the confidence of the bond market of the Fed's success. So if the bond market's starting to look around to say, hey, you're spending a lot of money, that could result in higher inflation, and that term premium may need to move higher because of higher issuance, that means that all of these calls for yields to go back to their prior lows or even to revert back to those 3% levels probably are a little bit too premature. I saw Jim Bianco catching some fish at a weekend. Yeah. Do you see that? He put the pictures out on Twitter or X, which is doing my head in. <laughs> he posted on You X. know what Jim thinks? Jim thinks that inflation is bottoming for the year. It's mm -hmm. not topping. Do you share that view? I think it's very possible. So if we think about inflation from a goods perspective, that's been where all of the disinflation has come from. Durable goods have gone from a peak inflation rate of 18%, and now they're running in deflation. They are very much correlated to shipping prices. So look at the price to move a container from Shanghai to Los Angeles. It fell 87% from its 2021 peak. What's it done in July? Up 45%. You're starting to see signs of the potential for high higher goods inflation, not just from durable goods, but also non-durable goods, including oil prices up 22%. I think that is a key watch item where we could see a reacceleration. Forgive me for being too simplistic, but is that good or bad for the S&P 500? I think it's bad from a valuation standpoint, and I actually think it's good from an earnings standpoint. Earnings are nominal. Higher inflation is good for earnings. And if we are to meet the uh -huh. earnings estimates for 2024, you need inflation to stay high. That's the key point. Cameron just nailed it. There is a belief out there that with the interest rate structure of 16 years ago and beyond, higher inflation is bad, bad, bad. And that's just not true when you look at history. It's just she nailed that, absolutely nailed that. Raises the question, Tom, of these soft landing <clears throat> hopes and dreams. If we do get it, why is that good for earnings? Well, it just means that we don't have an earnings recession, but that is what is already being priced in. And I think the challenge that we have is that how much of today's valuation trading at 19 and a half, 19.8 times earnings is pricing in that pivot by the Fed that is so confidently priced into 2024. So the, er the risk then going forward may not be on the earnings front. It may be on the valuation front, which is very similar to 2022. Given the multiple growth of the year so far, Cameron, thank you. Cameron Dawson of New Edge going through this market, all multiple growth. Lisa, we keep going back to the number one weighting of the S&P, but you look at the moves there and there's a story there, isn't there? Especially if you take what Cameron said and you take it one step further and basically suddenly bonds don't look good. So where are people going to put their money? Even if it's high multiples, if you're getting at least revenues and you're getting higher revenues at that, that might encourage people to go into stocks, even though there is a very high multiple being placed on that. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 on the S&P this morning. We are positive by zero. 0.3%. Coming up in about 45, 48 minutes, we'll catch up with Mike Wilson, chief US equity strategist over at Morgan Stanley with a note over the weekend about how fiscal policy has supported equities so far. And we'll get his view on whether he thinks that can last through to year end and beyond. And TK, I'm told we do have a picture. We've got the picture of Jim Bianco with a fish <coughs> over the weekend. Wait. Oh, we do. What, wonderful. Action photo. One action photo at Camp Kotok. Mm -hmm. Explain what is Camp Kotok. TK, where is this? this oh, is, I took that picture. You took that oh, photo. You took photo <laughs> yeah. can you, you're responsible now, for that. So you're on the other side of the boat. Can you, no wonder can they've you got the go same to view. Jackson Hole so we can get you and Bramo in a canoe out on the lake? I mean, Bramo, you, you were out there. If this is an open invite, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that, it. This bring the fantastic. sturgeon up again. For those of you on radio, this is a beast that Bianco's wheeled in here. This is not the uh, end of the Chicago River towards Lake Mission. Bring that up again, please. Did you cook for this camera? This is... I'm just saying that wasn't the largest fish caught that day. Oh, oh and who would you be suggesting caught the largest fish? I'm just maybe somebody at this right. table. Maybe, maybe someone at this table who took the photograph. Is there any photo evidence of that at all? Oh, oh yes. are you being skeptical? No, I'm just saying, you know, fish <laughs> stories and fishing, you know, right. sort of go hand in is, hand. The truth is, is that I'm just suggesting that there might be a gender divide not to need to hold it up and show. I'm just saying. Uh, you might not be wrong. <laughs> D diversity, you know, diversity is in full swing at Camp Cote. Talk. They do switch from gin to vodka. It's been known uh, that they do that. This is really smart people way up, 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 up in, McKay, in, in Maine. McKee has been there. And it is at Camp Kotok, which is a beautiful lake, fresh water with sturgeon and fish. 
And can you see Cameron Dawson in aisle seven at L.L. Bean? I mean, you Absolutely know, not. you don't join L.L. Bean, Freeport, Maine. Where you buy like tents and stuff. Tents and stuff. I now get their magazines because of mm, you. Do you. Yes, because of him. <laughs> I never ordered from them, and now it's I get L.L. Bean. Well, it's, it's certainly a challenging case, but I don't, I don't think it runs afoul of the First Amendment. And there's a lot of confusion about this out there. From a prosecutor's standpoint, I think it's a legitimate case. But From an attorney general's point of view. But I think there are other considerations, and I would have taken those into account. It was William Barr, the former U.S. Attorney General, on CBS over the weekend. I've said it a few times. At the moment, you need a law degree in America to understand what is going on with American <coughs> politics. Your American equity market on the S&P 500 is positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. There's a lift here after a four-day losing streak. Let's see what Monday brings. In the bond market, you're tired by seven basis points at about 4.10.47. If you'd like a quick snapshot of foreign exchange at the moment for G10, the major currencies against the U.S. dollar, the dollar is stronger against all of them, including the euro, 109.78. We're negative here by 0.25%, Tom, on that currency pair. Well, the currency th th this morning, I mean, it's, it, it's there. But excuse me, the data is there. And if I look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, John, usually I can just, you know, uh, ad lib out and say, here's a data point that matters. I can't say that this morning. I don't have a statistic on the screen that says something to me. It's a quiet start to the week, Tom. Yeah. And then on Thursday, picks up. CPI Thursday morning, PPI Friday morning. Bit of Fed speak in between, but not heavy on the Fed speak. Bostic, Bauman, Harper, yeah. through the week. It's not everyone, is it, Lisa? I, I, yeah, just no. a couple This is important. I, you know, I, I went after Governor Bowman uh, as a certain kind just a of Fed bit. governor <laughs> and official. And I, was, I literally was, I was lecturing the kids to. this weekend. We were sitting at Saturday dinner talking you, about how the Fed came out. You described... Governor Bowman is Bob Dole's intern. She was <laughs> Bob Dole's intern. She's a political beast, and that's okay. Okay. But when the Fed was invented uh, coming out of 07 into 1912, and then with the independent Fed in 1951 with McChesney Martin, this is what we wanted, was an eclectic set of voices. Now, some, you know, old, old fogies would say, well, can only be monetary PhDs. No, it's eclectic. I just wish they voted like the Bank of England. I, knew I you'd just say wish that. there was more dissent. Do you know what we both said? Does on Bowman Thursday? agree with Bostick? We no. both said on Thursday we miss you. There was oh, a three-way no split. No, it's true. There was a three-way split on the MPC. Three-way on Thursday. I saw that. One voted to hold. The other eight wanted a hike, and two of the eight wanted fifty and not twenty-five. I saw it. You don't see that at the Fed, do you? No, I just wish we we would, and with great vener veneration, that we have someone very political, very community bank like Governor Bowman. Bostic is his own kind of economics, very different, say, from Brainerd or Clarida or others, that, Bill Dudley, others that we talk to every day. But that's the eclectic power of our central bank. And speaking of the community banking background, <clears throat> we were talking about the Kansas City Fed. When are they going to get a new president? Well, they got a new president. I saw that. They have Jeffrey Schmidt now, who is also of that community banking ilk coming to the fore. Uh -huh. So we can meet him in Jackson Hole, I'm sure. He knows the that. rules, right? Esther George used to pay for, for dinner at the diner. So he's got to pick up the tab. I hope is he there, knows. Is there anything listening. else? Is there anything else you'd like to? Lots uh, of other things. Drinks as well. Drinks. I'll, I'll run him breakfast. through the traditions. Yeah, breakfast too. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm and a golf like, cart to pick yeah. me up. <laughs> To take yeah, me to I was going to say a canoe ride together, but you're, you know, to the camera it position. Mm. They send a golf cart. That's right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I send a golf cart. I, I, I think, no. you know, I, I'm threatening. Don't you get the golf cart? I get the golf cart. I car. walk. Oh. And Mrs. Keene wants to go out and hike Wyoming, <laughs> and Mrs. Keene may attend with me. You're taking Mrs. Keene to Jackson Hole. I'm taking Hall. Mrs. Keene, and, and okay. you know, the basic idea here is the new president of the Kansas City Fed is going to have Pivot the puppy there. And so, you know, Mrs. King can take the so Kansas the City cool. Fed. Yeah, gonna pivot. Does management know you're making this a family trip? No, yeah. Exactly. Oh, now, now they do. She's going to go Valdery, Valdera. You know, uh, 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 sound of music thing. Okay. But in you know. Wyoming and not Austria. No, you do. <laughs> the mountains are all the same. <laughs> the mountains are mountains, right? There's What's the difference between creations. Vienna and Jackson Hall? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Cool. You should probably end up at Camp Kotak the way we're going. Wendy Benjamin to save the moment for us right now. Wendy Benjamin's in, is with Bloomberg News on the politics of, of the moment. Wendy, there was a photo in the zeitgeist over the weekend. Major Garrett sitting in for Margaret Brennan at Face the Nation. Folks, on Bloomberg Radio. One of our most popular moments, Sunday afternoon, where we replay the stuff Wendy Benjaminson watches all Sunday morning. And it was the green room at Face the Nation with four different types of Republicans witnessing this moment we're in. Give us some color 
of the divides and the nuances of a Republican Party shattered at the moment versus, say, 1860 or 1858. It's amazing the splits there, isn't it? Well, I, I wasn't there for the 1860 convention, but close. Um, but no, the, the Republican Party right now is not, you know, is not even the Republican Party I grew up with, let alone my daddy's Republican Party. This is um, a party that is deeply populist, that wants less trade, less immigration, um, you know, protecting benefits. Uh, it really is going after the blue-collar working class American, as opposed to the Reagan Revolution Republican, who, of course, was for laissez-faire regulation and let the market do what it wants, and immigrants are welcome because, you know, they keep production up. And so it's a, it's a very different Republican Party, all driven by one man, Donald Trump. Okay, well, what's driven by one man, Donald Trump? Is that going to change after the Republican debate, or does that change after legal affairs? For our international audience, is there a next step for the former president when you, you know, look at this on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, he is certainly taking the next step, which is to fight as if it were a political opponent, the Justice Department and the judicial system. Uh, this week, we may see the fourth indictment in Georgia for his attempts to overturn the election there. Over the weekend, he went full throttle, going after the prosecutors, the judges, uh, potential witnesses by tweeting or putting on Truth Social, excuse me, if, I come, if you come after me, I'll come after you, um, which may put a protective order on witnesses today. We'll find out later today about that. But Donald Trump seems to be trying to take his legal troubles through a, through a campaign lens, and that may be how he runs his campaign. And whether the Republican Party sticks with him through thick and thin, there's no evidence right now that they're not going to. But if convictions start to pile up, maybe that will change. At the same time, a lot of people are, are trying to draw parallels between the Hunter Biden situation and some of the legal woes of the former President Trump. Some people say that's somewhat uh, not analogous. Regardless, there is a clear amount of legal concern around the current sitting president that overhangs that campaign. How many people in the Democratic Party are talking about potential other runners versus Kamala Harris, who's trying to take a much more significant role in the campaign? Well, I think there is a simmering whisper campaign, not so much about Hunter Biden, but more about the president's age and his ability to do his job for another four years. Um, and I think that's exactly why Kamala Harris is taking such a prominent role um, these days. She's out there as the attack dog. She's campaigning hard while the president, you know, was took a well-deserved vacation on the beach last week. He's back in Washington this week and is beginning to tour the country on campaign swings to push his economic, uh, economic ideas. But Harris is going to be a very active VP in this campaign. And I think it's because, frankly, her, the, her, the potential for her to be president is greater than it is for other VPs. Is that right, Wendy? Can we just go through that a little bit more? Is that based on age? Is that the worry there? I'm, maybe I'm just using the insurance actuarial tables, but, you know, I mean, Biden seems in perfect health, but he will be 81, 82 when he, uh, if he is reelected. And um, it, with four years to go, you know, people are keeping an eye on Kamala Harris because she would become the president. Based if, on her polling, something happened to him. do you think that's an asset for him on the campaign trail? I think in some quarters it is. Younger voters, minority voters, um, the more uh, liberal wings of the, of the Democratic Party uh, do like Kamala Harris. The more establishment people find her a little less appealing. You know, she wasn't a great candidate in 2019 when she ran against Biden. Um, she sometimes stumbles rhetorically. And so she's got some, some issues, but she's definitely an asset um, with, with a certain group of voters who are not enthusiastic about Biden. The phrase I hear a lot of is, is word salad associated with the, the vice president. Yes. Wendy, thank you. Wendy Benjamin, son yeah. of Bloomberg, down in Washington, D.C. A lot of word salad, Bramo, on some interesting issues. There was a New York Times article over the weekend where it talked about how personally she takes it and how she's been very defensive in a lot of her speeches because of the amount of criticism she's had. And so she's trying to change that and be more forceful. But either way, a lot of people say she's not going to really bring the popularity to the campaign 
that would that's necessarily. Subtle. I, I, that's that, subtle. Was, that was just <laughs> where I'm I old. mean, come on. Am I wrong? The numbers that say. Brilliant. That was brilliant. Uh oh. The numbers We're out of time. Thanks for coming. We're out of time. A sock gen. Join us shortly. Your equity market positive from New York. <laughs> Lisa, that was good. This yeah, is Bloomberg. <laughs> Equity's trying to bounce here on the S&P 500. Four-day losing streak. Biggest weekly loss going back to March on the S&P 500. Your equity market up here by 0.2%. Then that's that 100 positive by 0.4. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, 10-year. Aggressively higher on the yield side of things Monday through Thursday and then coming back on Friday following payrolls. Bit of a bounce this morning again um, by six or seven basis points on a 10-year, 410.26 on a two-year, 483.00. 31. We want to get to under surveillance. We've got some breaking news in the mix as well. We'll get to that in just a second. Under surveillance this morning. Plenty of Fed speak going into CPI this week, of course. We've talked about Governor Bauman and her comments over the weekend, indicating, quote, additional rate increases will likely be needed to get inflation on a path down to the FOMC's 2% target. We'll get more data later this week. CPI due on Thursday. PPI scheduled to come out on Friday. Elsewhere, I thought this one was notable, Tom. You'll be interested in this. Ukraine's war with Russia entering a new phase. Recent days have seen sea drones cripple a Russian yeah. naval vessel and an oil tanker for the first time. The attacks putting at risk Russia's commodity exports via the Black Sea TK, yeah. a route that, of course, you know, accounts for most of the grain and 10 to 20 percent of the all Russia sales on global markets. Somebody said over the weekend I'd absolutely nailed this with the Black Sea focus. I take great issue with it. There's nothing to nail it here at all. It's just the focus has been to the north near Belarus, maybe out to the west near the Polish border. And so much of this tension and particularly the tension with Mr. Putin is with Crimea the Sea of Azov and around to the Black Sea with the grain shipments and that. But it's more than just about grain. This is about the cultural nexus of where ancient Russia meets with modern Putin. You've talked about this from the very beginning <clears throat> of this conflict, Tom. Why is this at the heart of how this war progresses from here? Is it an international sea? You'll go through, you know, we don't need to do the geography now. we got some breaking news to get to, but very quickly here. You go to Istanbul, you go through that strait, you're up into the Black Sea. Is that international water or is it the playground of Russia? That's the ancient centuries-old debate. You wanted to get to that breaking news. Here it is. Jeff <clears throat> Curry leaving Goldman Sachs, the face of the firm's commodities research team for almost three decades, making a name for himself many times, Tom, with some pretty bold calls over the years. But on his way out of Goldman, as I understand based on our reporting, no sign yet as to the ultimate destination for him, but heading to the exit out of Goldman. I, I don't know what to make of this other than, you know, it's like a daily drip of people leaving Goldman. We can pay homage to Jeff Curry right now, the great microeconomist from Chicago, his style of call, what he's done with the gyrations of oil and that. Or is this more about Goldman Sachs with the announcement their family office had left, I think, Lisa, five days ago? I, I, th I think the family office type left. I immediately go, OMG, is Jeff Curry going to Sixth Street? We don't have reporting on that. I don't want to, you know, get any rumors or speculation going. But at the minimum, Lisa, with Mr. Curry exiting, this is a hugely fluid time for this venerable institution. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a sense based on the reporting of what actually is transpiring, where he's going, exactly what the catalyst was. That said, taking a step back, this has been a hugely difficult time for commodities analysts. And, you know, not, I'm not talking about Jeff Curry. I just mean in general, when a lot of people have been calling <coughs> for a super cycle with a lack of investment in, uh, in fossil fuels because we're supposedly moving away, graduates are shifting away from that as a career. We're looking at the potential of some new energy that hasn't happened yet at a time Time when energy prices are starting to percolate back up to that super cycle that they were earlier talking about. For those reasons, I imagine Jeff Curry's not done. There's probably some That's, work to be done. Thank you, yes. I swear. Tom, there are certain people at certain places who are just the face of the research division. Yeah. And Jan Hatzius on the economic side is, is the face of economics at Goldman Sachs. Jeff Curry is the face of the commodities desk over at Goldman. TK, yeah, he's it. it. 
He really is it. But, well, the common theme there of Hatzius, of Bill Dudley and Ed McKelvey when they a big drove brands. economics, Steve Roach at Morgan Stanley, all these people have bulletproof academics. They've been right, they've been wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But the answer is they've got bulletproof academics. The, the, the nuances here, to pick three, Ed Morris at Citigroup, Francisco Blanche at Bank of America, and Jeff Curry, they're all different, but their common theme is huge academics that they bring to the table. Here's a quote in our story uh, from a former colleague of his. He's a little bit of a mad scientist. There's never a time I couldn't get a meeting with a CEO, an oil minister, or a hedge fund founder if Jeff Curry was with me. And that really speaks to what you're talking about, John, in oh, terms nice of the face of research. Gavin, he's, he's brilliant. I remember bumping into each other at Terminal 5 Heathrow on the same plane and we're just stopping there chatting. He just wanted to chat. He's, he's just one of the best. And I'm looking forward to see where he ends up because... I know he's going to do great wherever he goes, Tom, and he's going to want to talk about the issues that Lisa describes. There are many in the commodity market at he, the moment. He helped finance uh, a movie on the kinks. So, you know. I didn't know that. Maybe he was tired of waiting. Okay. Tired of waiting. You see, you <laughs> suck me in. I think you. All right. They spit you right back out. That's what he said to Mr. <laughs> Solomon. Don't know if that For was you. True or not. We still won't, even after. You that. made the point about what's happening at Goldman, a lot of people leaving. Oh, oh, I, a lot of I, 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 we're trying to be key, diplomatic here on the Monday morning, key departures. folks, but yeah and, yeah, and frankly, making way less headlines, the, uh, the, the woman that ran family office leaving five or six days ago is probably a bigger deal than Mr. Curry leaving. Anyways, there's the breaking news. Srinata Rajan will have much more from Bloomberg News on this through the day as we report out Mr. Curry's exit from Goldman Sachs. She is with the Derivative House of Paris. Society General Subhadra Rajapa joins us right now, head of U.S. rate strategy. Subhadra, with great respect for your research, what's changed, what's new as you gallivant into August? What's changed is really the trajectory for the data. I mean, the expectation was that in the second half, you should start seeing a slowdown in the data. Uh, employment should start to moderate. Uh, inflation, of course, is moderating as we had expected. But broadly speaking, the economy has been extraordinarily resilient to very high interest rates. So that's really what's really throwing everybody into a loop. Uh, I'd say it's been a very, very frustrating year for both the bond bulls as well as the bond bears because, uh, you know, at, at certain times of the week, you know, both, both the bulls and the bears are, are right. And it's been a very, very tough call in the markets given the fact that the economy seems to be, uh, you know, doing well despite higher interest rates. I, 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 Sabrina, we've got a new rate regime, and my make great theme for this morning is maybe there's a deflationary tinge out there on asset repricing as well. Are you pricing in the dynamics of assets dropping in price with a rate strategy, or are they discrete right now? Well, I mean, asset prices are going to have to drop eventually with higher interest rates. But, you know, you are seeing a, uh, a bottoming out, if you will, of the housing market. You're seeing some, some improvements there in, in the recent data. So it feels like there's a little bit of an adjustment process going on as we speak to higher interest rates. Um, so asset prices seem to be adjusting quite well. How long that lasts is yet to be seen. Some of the risky assets are coming under pressure because of higher interest rates, but real yields are around 1.8%. So at this point, it feels like a persistence of higher yields is what the market needs for a, re, uh, a readjustment of asset prices. Do we seem more likely to get that? I mean, we were speaking with Cameron Dawson earlier this morning, and she said that there seems to be a feeling that we're facing a sea change where suddenly the fiscal backdrop really does push longer-term yields higher in a more material way, and that seems stickier. You know, it's the fiscal backdrop really has to be within the broader context of the economic backdrop. If the economic backdrop was not as strong as it is right now, um, then you'll see that people will discount the fiscal backdrop and start buying bonds, regardless of how much is being issued. Uh, of course, uh, you know, this time is different relative to what we saw back in 2011 when the S&P downgraded uh, the U.S. Uh, sovereign. Uh, the U.S. sovereign. Um, but again, you know, in the, in the big scheme of things, we are a reserve currency, and you are going to see demand for treasuries regardless. So to me, the, the broader economic backdrop is, is, uh, is key. What 
higher debt and deficits means is it's more of an accelerant towards higher yields. If yields are already heading higher, you're going to see a lot more of a push higher in, in yields, as well as a lot more volatility uh, in bonds as we progress higher in yields. So given where your economic outlook is, how much do you push back against some of the recent rise in yields and buy longer term bonds? How much conviction can you have? You know, that's a, that's been a very, very frustrating trade, uh, you know, for us in particular. Earlier on in the year, we said, you know, go long bonds and it worked out going into the regional banking crisis. Now, we're exactly at that same spot, waiting for something else to break so that bonds would be uh, attractive for, for investors. But that's not happening as of yet. You know, the things that I'm watching where I'm at is, is inflation expectations. You've seen the five-year forward, five-year break-even rise quite meaningfully over the last you know, couple of weeks uh, or even before that. And then you have uh, higher uh, real yields over the past uh, week. So higher real yields, higher inflation expectations, um, you know, generally precede the market pricing in for, for more hikes. So I am looking to see what the market will price in going forward, given the sharp rise in inflation expectations. Sabadra, wonderful to get an update from you and the team. Sabadra Japa there of SockGen on this bond market. Despite all the drama last week, the 10-year yield ended the week higher by just eight basis points. Lisa, after all of that, after those moves across Monday through Thursday, we just had this massive rally on Friday to close out the week off the back of the payrolls report. It really raised some questions because the payrolls report was basically whatever you wanted to make of it. It had a story for you if you wanted to explain possibly anything. So the why behind it, was it positioning? And yet today we're restarting that which to me is important to note, that we're restarting the sell-off. And most people are coming on and saying, we're all paying a little closer attention to this in a material way. The capitulation continues on Wall Street. The recession calls said a few times to drop in like flies. It was Mike Gapin of Bank of America, Mike Farolia, JP Morgan, all of that in the past week. The week before, Chairman Powell in the news conference basically telling us all that the Fed staff have dropped their recession call. You've had a series of upgrades <clears throat> on the equity market as well. I think the city who made a big upgrade. Others too, and this from Tallback and Michael Purvis just moments ago, Tom, 4,300 new price target. That one's been hiked from 36.50 on the S&P for year end. This is important because he synthesizes global data into a domestic call. It's not just about earnings with Michael Purvis. And what's important, there's not the single number, but the vector of, of looking higher is not a small issue. Well, if you also take a look at the revision, 36.50, that was pretty low if you take a look at some of the sell-off that that would imply. Mm -hmm. 4,300. This is people reassessing to a recession that never happened and they're pushing out. That's I, the bottom I, line. I can't emphasize enough how the calendar is important here. And I would suggest in August we are having October feelings here. How many people are behind? Michael Purvis knows this. There's a body of Wall Street that's massively behind this. And it's not like they're in a meeting saying, you know, let's buy the triple leveraged equity fund. No, they're not doing that. But at the margin, they have to be buyers of shares. Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, coming up shortly. Live from New York, welcome to the program. If you are just joining, equity futures right now on the S&P, positive by zero. 0.26%. That conversation with Mike Wilson just about 18 minutes away. The chief equity strategist over at Morgan Stanley put out a note over the weekend, Lee, so I know you and I have both read it, basically attributing much of the move this year and maybe the pushing out of recession calls on fiscal policy. To me, this was actually the most interesting thing to read. Not OK, people will say, Mike Wilson, how can you come out and say anything? People get things right. People get things wrong. The reasoning is often the most interesting. The idea that never in the history of this country? Have they increased fiscal spending at a time where the unemployment rate was this low? And seeing the debt increase at a time of rising interest rates, this is a yeah. game changer to him. So how does he parlay that into the valuation call, the multiple call that you were talking yeah. about, and where right. people are going to put their and money? And to be clear here, and I'd go further and say this is not pandemic stimulus. This is infrastructure stimulus. It's almost, some would say Republicans clearly would say it's a stealth stimulus as well of funding. I, I don't belittle at all the call. I think that Mike Wilson's really on to something here and that some portion of our buoyancy that not all, some feel right now is just simply based on oomph from Washington. He's got a great chart in that research. If you get a chance of looking at it, it's the deficit as a percentage of GDP at the left side, unemployment down at the bottom, and we're somewhere sort of to the bottom to the left, which is like... You just don't see a deficit this large with unemployment 
this slow. I, I'm getting looking back decades. I, I, John, I'm getting massive emails on kinks. I mean, people love. Is, it, is this actually true? You it, really got me. You got me, guy. I I went through two copies of the first Kinks album. Did you? Yeah, it was that good. It was. Do you want to sing it, us out? It, 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 you would love it. Mm. I'm trying to find some truth. You're not seeing that trade-off between tech and rates the way you did last year. Every time rates went up, tech went down. You're not seeing that right now because tech has come through with good earnings, even in higher rates. And they've got so much cash, they're now earning money on some of that cash. So that whole idea that tech is going to be in trouble because rates are going higher is a little bit difficult on the very mega tech, tech side to see. Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Words, the chief market strategist on tech earnings. Tech earnings, disappointing for the likes of Apple last week. Biggest one-day drop of the year for Apple. The stock is negative by 4.8% on <clears> Friday, <throat> Tom. It was down Thursday, Wednesday, right. Tuesday. I can see you shaking your head. I know you've got something to say here. Apple this morning, positive right. in the pre-market. Well, well, this is not gospel, but what adults do in the markets, they look at standard deviation moves. And to your correct point, John, Apple had a solid two standard deviation move to a lower, weaker price, unlike some of the success stories that were out there at last week. But with that, I, you know, it's not like it's a technical breakdown. I thought Sarah Hunt, uh, when we spoke to her, was on fire. I thought she was just great. Dan Ives of Wedbush still bullish, Tom, still bullish on the stock, <clears throat> despite a weak earnings report raising their price target from 220 to 230 iPhones and services will accelerate in the June quarter with the softness all, I, all, all Mac and iPad driven. When excluding FX and focusing on the hearts and lungs, iPhones and services, this was a strong performance and guidance in our view, and we would be strong buyers on any weakness. Well, Tom, I can tell you in the last week, we've had some of that. We've had some weakness. Doing some important research now. Joining us from Hirschkabu Leeds, Spillian 25, 1017 PS Amsterdam, where Apple says, Vilgeventen vat voor jo the best cruise east is Daniel Ives. He is in Amsterdam and joins us by phone uh, this morning. Dan Ives, does Apple sell in Amsterdam like it sells in New York, like it sells in Chicago, like it sells in L.A.? They do. I mean, I can tell you by you know, what, what I've seen here. And what, what Apple has always had the presence, not just in Amsterdam, but across Europe. And I think if you look at the quarter, like, like, like Farrah was talking, I focus on iPhones, services, China, gross margin. That was all better than expected. Mac and iPad, we right. that view as noise. Dan, in Europe, they want to go after Google. They want to go after Microsoft, indeed, the evil Apple as well. Let's say that they are, in a sense, anti-technology. That's the political elites. Are the people of Amsterdam, the people of Berlin, et cetera, Oslo, are they anti-Apple, anti-Google, anti-technology? They're not anti-Apple. They're actually pro-Apple, and I think investors are pro-Apple. I think when it comes to the EU and what we see from a regulatory, that's a whole other situation. But I think it just comes down to fines for big tech companies like Apple, Google. At this point, that's like drinking a cup of coffee. And I think the investors are going to continue to be that as background noise even though the heat gets hotter in the kitchen. Well, let's talk about the heart and lungs of it, Dan. I think over the weekend, someone in Barron's said something like iPhone zero, zero growth. Now, Dan, we've had three quarters of that. The stock's trading at a multiple of 30, 30 times earnings, and it's up 40% year to date. What's the argument still that this is a growth stock? Well, first, you have 400 bips of FX headwind. So, so the zero percent, when I view it from a currency perspective, where they're growing, and then you look at now what goes into the iPhone 15, which I view as basically a mini super cycle. You have 25% of the install base that is not upgraded in four plus years. So even though they've gone through what I'll call conservative growth, that's going to now start to be high single digit, potentially double digit. And then at the same time, services, that is the key to the re rating. Now you're starting to see double-digit services growth. And I think that's the perfect storm positive that I see going 2024. Part of your bullish thesis for a long time has been this base that haven't upgraded their phone. Dan, at some point, does that base get big enough that actually that's no longer a bullish thesis, that they've just been sitting there and they're not upgrading year after year after year after year? Do you start to change your mind about why they're not upgrading? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think the other thing is they're adding iPhone. I mean, they've added over 150 million iPhone users just if you look at the last 18 months. So I think what's starting to happen now, that's 1.2 billion, which at one point was below a billion before COVID. So I think what's starting to happen is they're gaining more and more share in China. They've gained 300 bips of market share in China in the last two years, despite the geopolitical. And I think it just comes down to you'll see the bears come out on Apple, especially over the last week. But I believe this is just a pause. Selling Apple into this iPhone 15 cycle, in my opinion, it's leaving the Super Bowl at halftime. I love I love iPhone Zero. I've got to say, John, I'm still thinking about that. Are you going to get an iPhone 15? No, I'm going to get an iPhone Zero. Zero growth. I mean, that's sort of what uh, Barrett right. was going after them uh, for. There is a question, though, Dan, of what you do with the multiples, with the valuation of a stock at a time where some people are speculating that there is not a lot of growth in the smartphone industry. Nothing really wrong against Apple. Just in general, there has been this real slowdown. At what point can you continue to be bullish on on Apple shares, if you continue to see longer term rates creep higher, if you continue to see the valuation proposition challenged on a more macro front? Sure. And, and excellent point. I'd, I'd also say it's something Key and I have talked about a lot. The, the gross margin store, I mean, the highest gross margins ever, because of what, what, what we've seen on the M2 chip and the innovation, the margin there, and that's going to continue to go higher. That's just higher from, from a margin perspective. And I believe services is the key. Services, in my opinion, is worth 1.3 to 1.4 trillion alone. And even though we have this from a from a tech multiple headwind perspective, I think it starts to abate. And I think services is ultimately the key to how this thing re rates higher, along with an iPhone 15 cycle <clears throat> that I believe is going to be massive. This really speaks, Dan, to this question around uh, what the content will be that really feeds some of their services. This idea that Lionel Messi was name checked on the call uh, as one of the reasons why they've seen a real increase in subscribers. So, what are they going to use with that cash pile to acquire more content? Are they going to buy, you know, I don't know, a London football team? Well, I, I mean, I think, and I think you've seen it a bit in terms of some of the things that they've talked about. They're going to continue to expand Apple TV. I think from a streaming perspective, they're going to go after more rights, obviously, Pac-12 story that we saw over the last week. But I think the big thing is going to be AI. I mean, I think ultimately they're going to further build out this AI, what I believe is going to be an AI app store. And that is going to be the next wave of growth as they further monetize an unparalleled install base in Cupertino. Messi making the MLS look like child's play. You see that over the weekend, honestly. <laughs> It's like thinks I saw someone tweet something like it's like easy mode. It's like cheat mode for Messi I, in the MLS. Just different <laughs> standard. Dan, thank you, sir. Dan Ives of Wedbush, still constructive, optimistic on this name <clears throat> ahead of the launch time. You said a million times we've played this game so many times over the years. It's dead, it's dead, it's dead. Right. New phone comes out and boom, and we'll see what this quarter holds. But certainly the trend over the last three quarters has not been yeah. favourable for this stock. They're the fundamentals, but ultimately the stock itself has performed tremendously well, up by 40%. I think the argument that people made for a while is that maybe it does get that higher multiple because you make this switch from hardware to services. And on that front, we are seeing that development take place, Tom, based on the numbers we saw overnight on Thursday into Friday. Yeah, I'd get out the calendar as well. It's August 6, 7, whatever it is today. And the answer is off of the earnings uh, announcement, how close are we to another six phone call, multi-gazillion dollar bond offering? Why not? At these rates? At these rates, I think they're oblivious to the rates. They, you know, they're fine. Spread it out. I just wonder, honestly, have you guys gotten a new phone recently and you have to trans like translate all of the data and all of the contacts and you basically have to reset all your passwords and you have to do all that? Yeah. I think there's sort of a, a, a friction, a natural friction. Like, no, they make it pretty easy, don't they? Do they? At Apple, yeah. You, you, do you not have an iPhone? I, I have an iPhone. It's oh, just, they it's make old. it pretty easy. It's pretty old. Oh, no, they'll make that pretty easy for you now. Really? Are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you product placement? No, I'm, I've, mine's old, but I don't. I know what you're saying. Typically, it used to be, but yeah, no. Yeah, but not anymore. No, no, no. I don't no. know. It's pretty just... straightforward to upgrade the phone. Okay, but why Why would someone get a new phone? For the camera? If you tell me you want it faster, you want better battery, and you want a better camera. And clearly, the battery, the it degrades. You can see that. You feel it. It happens. It's real. I'm what not about just making you? it up. What yeah. about a person like you? 
Um, I think it would have to be a pretty revolutionary change to get me to change at this point. I was actually on the way home from work on Friday and I was staring at this thing and I was just thought, they've made it so well and it lasts so long. And that didn't used to be the way with hardware. Mm-hmm. Do you remember when you had a choice of phones? It wasn't just Samsung and iPhone and you actually had to go and make a choice, a decision. Sony, Motorola, you know, everyone yeah, yeah. used to have a phone top. Sharp. I skipped the, that. I was still on the phone. Different face. Yeah. It's like going like this, <laughs> trying to test. But they used to break all the time. <laughs> I Tom know. used to break all the time. And they don't now. And they and don't now. I, I would look at my one variable, to be optimistic, is the trade-in value of all this stuff we have. It's a great gimmick for them. Yeah. What's your phone worth, John? Your phone, because it is John Farrell's phone. <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> that yield curve steepening trend, it's already anticipating Fed rate cuts. It's hard for me to believe that the Fed is gonna cut as fast as people expect them to. We are starting to see some of the effects of the fiscal support that we saw over the past few years. How much actual breaking does the Fed tolerate? The so-called Godot recession still hasn't shown up. It may show up at some point. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramus, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, deep into the summer days of August as well. Lots to talk about. Yardeni talking about Godot. John, we're not waiting for Godot. We're waiting for an inflation report later this week. Yeah, this is the runway, Tom, the calendar. So August 10th is CPI. The next report <clears throat> after that, I believe, is September 13th. Then there's a Fed decision on September 20th. You may or may not hear from Chairman Powell at Jackson Hole. Somewhere in between the 24th and the 26th, of August of those dates for that symposium. But Tom, so far so good. You're seeing progress. You're seeing payrolls decelerate, job openings come down, the quits rate fall. You're making progress. But ultimately at the moment, the inflationary data in the unemployment report, you look at a labour market, Tom, that still looks hot to me, an unemployment rate that's 3.5% and wage growth has a four handle. And for most people, that means this Fed is not ready to cut anytime soon. There's two phases to this. Phase one is hike, phase two is hold. Goolsby wants you to start thinking about phase two. So even the doves on the committee aren't talking about cuts. Right. They just want to be done with hikes and they want to sit here for a while and, getting and used, wait for inflation to come back and down. And getting used to a new inflation regime. The most important thing for me this morning, besides the Jeff Curry news, we'll address that in the hour, Mr. Curry, Dr. Curry, I should say, leaving Goldman Sachs. To me, the real news this morning is the German 30-year yield back to 2014. Internationally in finance, we're getting new, used to a new higher rate regime. That's what's new this August. Well, let's take a 10-year view. We've talked about this for a while. Two anchors around the neck of the global bond market. One, the Bank of Japan. Two, the ECB. ECB anchors away last 12 months. BOJ, last few months, starting to see the same thing start to develop. Tom, that's a big change. So we need to work out, is this a new floor for the global bond market, for global bond yields? Or are we starting to talk about a new ceiling? Can yields go much higher from here? Or right. ultimately, can they only fall so far? That's a debate we'll have in the f- next few weeks. I would suggest, Lisa, that the larger companies that we've talked about, uh, particularly with Dan Ives here moments ago on big tech, Life goes on at these rates, but I don't understand if we see a breakout in a 30-year mortgage in America, 7.38%. I think the high was 7.41%. Can we start to frame an 8% mortgage? I'm not there yet, but boy, does that change the dialogue. There's a bigger question, especially as people shift away from this idea that we're going to go back (coughs) to lower long-term rates. Was that debt reckoning that everyone was talking about that we were supposed to experience when the Fed and the ECB raised rates, was that actually just taken off the table or was that really deferred until now, until a time when suddenly people start to think about the fact that we do have debt, we do have fiscal spending that does continue, and suddenly money costs something in a material way. Right. That's the key phrase. The inflation picture is not going back to what it used to be. That really raises questions long term for a lot of markets. And it, 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 all of a sudden, there's a cost of money. It's the heart of the matter. John, let's begin the data. I'm looking at the inflation adjusted 10 year yield, the statistic I use, the 10 year tip, 1.71%, lower than 1.80, but more, rest- more restrictive, more higher than it was two, three weeks ago at 1.50. Well, let's go to the nominal yield as well, Tom. Yields up this morning by six basis points at 4.0945%. You're all aware at this point we are on a four-day losing streak on the S&P 500 and trying to look for a bounce up by, let's call it a quarter of 1% on the S&P, Tom. Biggest weekly loss, going back to March, Tom, last week for the S&P 500. 
<clears throat> and it's as simple as that. I mean, the equity markets where they are, the VIX 17.12 is out above uh, the calm of a 13, even a 12 statistic seen over the recent number of weeks. Our conversation of the day now on the equity markets, the stock market with Michael Wilson. Mike Wilson, CIO and Chief U.S. Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Mike, you go over and you study Ellen Zettner's notes and you look at fiscal tightening. Describe fiscal tightening. Describe what it means for the Standard & Poor's 500. Yeah, good morning, guys. Uh, yeah, look, I think, you know, I don't think we've hit a wall completely here, but I think it's fair to say that the fiscal <laughs> impulse that we've experienced over the last 12 months uh, caught a lot of people off guard, uh, including ourselves, and it has really kept the economy going in a way that most people were not projecting. Um, and that has led people to believe that this can continue. Now, there's been a confluence of events. Uh, for why interest rates have risen. I wouldn't blame it all on the downgrade last week. In fact, probably none of it is. I think the bigger issue is just simple supply and demand. We have an enormous amount of supply to fund all this spending at a time when perhaps some of the natural buyers are not there anymore. For example, the banking system, pretty full up on treasuries. And of course, the, the Bank of Japan's changed last week. So, you know, I think the interest rate move, look, first of all, stocks were already expensive on their own cost of capital going up. Now, think about it this way. The, 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 the recovery we've had since COVID has been funded by the government for the most part, okay? And now their cost of capital is going up. So that has to have some sort of a, you know, some sort of a knock-on effect to mm -hmm. valuations. If we were trading at a lower valuation here, I wouldn't be so concerned about the growth outlook. But, you know, given our growth, our growth outlook, which is right. more pessimistic than most, that's where the that's where you have a real issue. And, and look, you can still make money picking stocks. It's just a harder game. You well, know? That, and I think that's what most clients are, yeah, are having th trouble th with. That's where I wanted to go, Mike Wilson. I think this is so important. If we get a fiscal tightening and whatever your matrix is of equity dynamics folded into economics, if you will, does it lead to a more aggregate summed index or is it where sectors and selected stocks, including the glorious eight tech stocks, they're partitioned out. They do great while everybody else struggles. Well, that's been the bet that has worked so far this year. But now even those stocks seem to be tiring. I mean, this you know this earnings season has been a sell the news, uh, so to speak, if you want to call it that. Even though even with companies that put up good numbers, it's been kind of a faded because the market anticipated you know kind of this stronger economic bounce this year and perhaps earnings not being as bad as people were, were thinking, <clears throat> and then we kind of muddled through. So now the, the question, I think for the, you know, for this rally to continue, it has to happen internally, right? We have to have breath improve. We need to see a rotation into some of these lagging areas. We've started to see that. We're not convinced yet that the breath, the way we measure breath is not convincing to us yet, but we're open-minded to it. Um, but that's, that would be the next stage of the bull market. If you want to be bullish, you have to be buying laggards here. You can't just keep chasing you know, the Magnificent Seven and forget about everything else. That's not a healthy outcome. What about what Cameron Dawson was talking about, especially at a time of rising yields, in part due to the fiscal backdrop, the supply and demand that you're talking about? It turns out that stocks become not a Tina trade, but a little bit. There isn't another alternative that's much better. Revenues are going up in an inflationary environment. Yes, multiples look high, but what are you going to do? Go into bonds that are uh, losing value at this point? I mean, how much do you buy that type of argument? Well, we don't buy it because our view is that inflation is coming down much more rapidly from, you know, at the company level than it is in the government statistics. And this is where I think it could get really interesting in the or tricky in the second half of the year, which is we have government statistics reporting inflation still at 3 to 4 percent. So the Fed is, you know, going to continue to hold or maybe even raise more. Yet what companies are actually seeing in their businesses, Lisa, are, you know, deterioration. Like we have negative price now in many of the good sectors. Right. The PPI finished goods is in negative territory, export pricing, import pricing. So it's the opposite of 2021. Think of it this way. In the back half of 2021, companies were getting 15, 20 percent price. Yet the Fed was on hold because they were saying, well, we're not sure yet this is going to be permanent. Of course, they were late to the party and companies got to over earn at a very low interest rate. Now you have the exact opposite. Interest rates are being held very, very high at a time when company earnings for the majority, not all, but the majority of companies is deteriorating. I mean, sales growth is not increasing, especially going down. And we have 0% sales growth in the second quarter. And if we're right on this pricing dynamic, 
then that's going to be something that catches folks off guard. That's why we're not going into small caps and the lower quality parts of the market. If you're going to go to the laggers, make sure you go to laggers that have good balance sheets and good margin structures. Okay, so it's still a quality play, just you know the different, just different quality names. If inflation is going to come down and come down rapidly, then why wouldn't that really favor a Fed rate cut that could turbocharge some of the trade into big tech? Well, because I think, I mean, the Fed. No, I mean they—they they know they made a mistake, and they said it, right? They said they know they were a little bit late on the transitory call. Okay, fine. There, I mean, why would they cut rates if we have full employment? There's, I mean, there's no reason to do that. Unemployment is three and a half percent. You have inflation still north of three percent, so not anywhere near their goal. Just hold. I mean, I'm not—I'm not making the case they need to raise rates here. I, I don't think they need to do that. But I think they're going to want to see the whites of the eyes to make sure that things are down. I, I'm not, I don't work at the Fed. I don't know what they're going to do. But my, my prudence would say that's what they should do. They should, they should pause and see what happens and not try to anticipate too much here because that got them in trouble last time. Mike, can we just finish with your framework, post-pandemic framework? We'll remember it well. It was hot and short. The cycle would be hot, but ultimately it would be shorter than what we'd seen previously. Now, Mike, it certainly was hot. And you've got the equity market call coming out of the pandemic dead on. But, Mike, does anything lead you to question the short part? Because I think that's where the conversation is quickly shifting, as you know, over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, this is going to sound ironic. OK, so uh, as you remember, back in January, I was concerned that everybody was too bearish, uh, including ourselves. And that proved to be the right, you know, I should have gone with my instinct. And now, though, I think the, the fact that everybody is saying that the recession risk is eliminated for the most part, including the Fed itself, right? They had, they had called for recession back in March, at least the staff did, and they backed off that too. Like, I, I don't know if we need a full-blown recession, but I'm pretty convinced that growth is still slowing. Like we're in a down cycle. Now, whether that leads to a full-blown labor cycle or not remains to be seen. I think most people have pushed out the recession call to 24. I don't think they've said it's eliminated. So is it, it may be a four-year cycle as opposed to a three-year cycle. That's very plausible. I still really – I really like our boom-bust, you know, short-cycle thesis based on the 40s because I see the data really supporting that, John. And part of our note over the weekend, and you can appreciate this because you've followed it the whole time, is that we, you know, we got – you know, we kind of missed this fiscal impulse, right? That was a big miss on our part. We thought the fiscal impulse would come at the time that they really needed it. The thing about it this way, they're doing they're doing eight percent budget deficit spending when you have three and a half percent unemployment. I mean that's really unprecedented. So what's going to happen if we do get a slowdown next year? And I, I just think that I just think this boom bust thesis is still correct. And maybe the market's looking through it to the to the other side. I, I, look, that's that's a risky proposition given where valuations are. It was a, it was a great idea to buy stocks last fall. We traded it. We didn't stick with it long enough. Okay. But I think at this stage, you need to be very selective, very selective for some sort of retracement, at least back to the 200-day moving average. Mike, wonderful to get your thoughts. An update on the team over at Morgan Stanley on equity research. Mike Wilson there of Morgan Stanley. Just fantastic to catch up with Mike on the path forward from here. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Your equity market positive by, let's call it, a quarter of 1%. Coming up shortly, we'll talk about the U.S. economy, looking ahead to CPI on Thursday and PPI data on Friday. But Lisa, ultimately, that was what was in the research from Morgan Stanley over the weekend. And Mike Wilson, the team, pointing out that the surprise for them was the fiscal easing we've ultimately seen. And the fact that the budget deficit is as large as it is at a time that unemployment is still at 3.5 percent is pretty remarkable stuff. And if you spin that forward to next year, what he's saying is if we get weakness, where will the appetite be to increase spending to counteract that potential weakness? In other words, if we do go into recession, what will the counterbalance in the fiscal terms be? Yes, you'll have the monetary policy, you'll have rates coming in, but not necessarily some sort of spending package. It's a salient point, but it highlights the degree of uncertainty that we're at right now in terms of the precariousness of the picture. Some people saying it's a backward-looking uh, kind of instrument. Run on cue, Andrew Hong yes. Horse, City. <laughs> a true soft landing involves inflation slower to 2% while the economy avoids recession. Some economists and Fed policymakers see this as the most likely economic scenario. Andrew and the team say, in our view, it is the least well supported by empirical <laughs> and theoretical evidence. More on that a little bit later. From New York, good morning.
every few months, right, we make sure we publish an update on our targets, our price target for the S&P. A couple of my cross-asset models are deteriorating. They were improving back in May. So in other words, the, the appeal of stocks relative to bonds is worsening. This just feels to me like a market, while I think everything has been deserved in terms of what we've done so far, it just feels like this market needs to stop, pause, have a little moment of digestion and catch its breath. We do for a pause the message from Larry Carasina, the head of U.S. equity strategy over at RBC Capital Markets. This Monday morning, good morning to you. Equities positive by 0.3% on the S&P 500. There is a lift here in this market on the Nasdaq as well. In the bond market, yields a bit higher here on a 10-year time by six or seven basis points, the 410. Crude lower this morning. Interesting move given what's developed over in Ukraine between Russia. We are negative by 0.7% on WTI at $82. Brent softer too by the same amount to $85 and about 60 cents. I think, Tom, we can call this a new phase in the war, in the conflict between Ukraine yes. and Russia. Yeah. The scene over the weekend, Tom, we've seen pictures of it. Sea drones crippling a Russian naval vessel. Yeah. And this is a key heart, as you know, Tom, just a key, key passage for commodities coming out of Russia. I strongly agree with the idea it's a new phase. And I don't think that's in the zeitgeist. It's not in the front of the New York Times, Bloomberg News. Washington Post and the rest of it. Wait till Thursday or Friday. You may get a lot of really smart reporting on that. But the question is, does it fold into commodities and does it fold into oil? Yeah, we saw wheat move. I, you know, I, I went to someone, Eric Martin, at our, our wonderful IMF reporter, can't remember. And I said, if I want to follow wheat in the Mediterranean, what do I follow? And he said, Chicago, which surprised me. But the answer is Rotterdam, I think, has wheat. I can't remember. But the answer is you got to watch these commodity prices just to see what they do. The thing in oil, which is interesting, is there we were comfortable sub-80. Now we're 85, 86 on Brent crude. Is anyone modeling out an equal jump up to 90, 91? I don't see it. Triple digits? Yeah, I'm not there. But even the drama of getting to 90, 91, yeah. I don't see in prices. Jeff there. Curry of Goldman. And if you are just joining us, welcome. Jeff Curry, the news this morning. He's departing the firm, leaving Goldman. <clears throat> His last price target, Tom, was 85, though. I believe, year-end on yeah. crude, $85 a barrel, which is basically where we are right now on Brent. Later in this hour, Sri Natarajan, encyclopedic on Goldman Sachs, will join us here on uh, the travails of the firm right now. Right now, we're going to join on oil, and we do so with a terrific academic on oil. Julian Lee is Bloomberg oil strategist that barely describes the ability here to take supply, demand, and fold it into the global politics, the political economics of oil. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I want to go right to the mystery, which is oil demand. It's simple. We have great reporting from your team, Chun Zizhu, among others, saying, what a shock, price up, demand down. Where will demand be if we get prices to stay here at Jeff Curry's $85 a barrel? Does demand change? I, I'm not seeing a big change in demand. I mean, one of the things that has, has been a theme throughout must, much of this year has been um, the, the slower place, pace of demand recovery in China than many people were expecting uh, after the easing of, of lockdowns earlier in the year and the opening up of travel. And I think one of the things that, that people didn't quite get earlier in the year was that oil isn't um, quite such a, a sort of transport dominated fuel in China as it is, say, in the United States or even in Europe, where the bulk of oil demand is in transportation. Therefore, the opening up of transportation has a big impact. In China, it's probably only about half of oil demand that's in the transport sector. So when you open up that, that area, the impact on demand isn't anywhere near as great as it would be in, in the US. And I think people therefore tended to overestimate right. what the demand rebound would be in China. As you know, it's such a hard game, uh, Dr. Lee, to guesstimate what oil will do. So we fall back on what are called, folks, fan distributions, which is a probability distribution of what Julian Lee thinks is out there somewhere. How is your fan distribution of oil price changing looking out one year, or dare I say two years? Well, I, Tom, I, I am no longer in the game of, of price forecasting. That was uh, something that I used to, to yeah, well, do no one's in my, watching. my it's previous Ju Julian, occupation. Julian, and, it's and, August. Know. It's August, um, Julian. No one's watching. Give me a single point quote <laughs> based off your fan distribution. Uh, look, 
I, I mean, I, I think we, we have to look at what people who are much cleverer than me and, and um, much more involved in sort of monitoring the market and the, and the, the movements of prices and, and supply and demand on a day-to-day -day basis are saying. And, and what we're seeing from them is that these forecasts of, of triple-digit prices um, by the end of this year have, have, as you said earlier, have largely disappeared. And we're seeing um, most people suggesting prices in the range of sort of 80 to, to 95, perhaps, by the end of the year. And the, the difficulty with this now is that so much of this is dependent upon the political decisions that are taken in Riyadh. And this, this isn't even an, an OPEC or an OPEC plus decision anymore. This is, this is solely a Saudi decision. And if, if you look at the recent um, output cuts, these have been really unilateral cuts by Saudi Arabia, sometimes bringing some of their partners along with them, but showing a willingness to go it alone. They have cut their production target to the lowest that it has been uh, since the, the depths of, of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And if you take out the, you know, the, the pandemic um, months and the, the attack on uh, Saudi oil facilities shortly before that, this is the lowest Saudi production that we have seen for many, many years at, at around 9 million barrels a day. Now, I would question whether they are able to go much below that for any, any length of time, but they can certainly prolong these cuts. And in the second half of the year, we, where we were already expecting deficit, um, a, a, an oil supply deficit, prolonging these cuts will just deepen that. Just real quick here, Julian, what price target is Saudi Arabia targeting? <laughs> well, they will say uh, and, and have said repeatedly that they, they don't target a price. Uh, they are seeking balance in the market and the price will be what it is. Um, but I think if you look at the actions that they've taken, they were clearly uh, very unhappy with, with prices below 80. Uh, I think they probably want a price that's, that's closer to 90 at least uh, for Brent. Um, but, but as I say, you know, they will deny that they have any price target whatsoever. Of course they don't. No price targets in Saudi <laughs> Of course <Tom>. they don't. <laughs> Julian Lee, Julian, thank you. I'd love to know one day just what it is. You know, what is the price target? Where are they happy? I, I think it's a movable feast. We can take a guess. It's based off their fiscal need, okay. and the answer is on a 10, 20, 30-year basis. It's a higher number than it used to be is what I'd really focus on. Coming up in the next hour, look out for this. Keith Lerner of Truist, Oksana Aronoff of J.P. Morgan, Ashok Bhatia of New Burger Berman. So tons of stuff on bonds and Bidenomics and easy fiscal policy. And the questions that Mike Wilson over in Morgan Stanley have been asking over the weekend, have you ever seen a budget deficit this large with unemployment this low? No. Elisa? You can disagree with his view. You could say he got the equity call wrong. You can say all sorts of things. But he raises a very important point that a lot of people are talking about right now. The fiscal backdrop has changed materially from where it has been historically. And that is shifting people's understanding of where yields should be and shifting their understanding of where to invest. And that, I think, is an uncertainty and also a driving force that a lot of people are looking at right now. Keith Lerner on equities. Also, Oksana Aronoff of J.P. Morgan Asset Management on the credit market. I was going back through the previous thoughts of Oksana through the year and went back to spring. And in spring, she was talking about a credit market that was fully valued and high yield spreads were about 390. Then we had the collapse of SVB. It was right before that. Great. Spreads gapped out more than, what was it, 100 basis points through five percentage points again. And here we are all the way back down to what? About 390. Pretty amazing, isn't it, Lisa? Just the round trip we've been on in the credit market. It's defied all normal logic, right? Because we were supposed to get this slowdown. It never happened. The why is the reason why people are hinging on that fiscal story, because it's not necessarily just coming from an inherent strength that people saw in the market. That conversation still to come. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.2%. It's a quiet-ish start to the week. It will get busier from Orange. Thursday with inflation data, Seriously. your main event. CPI, a few days away. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrow on assignment, getting ready for the <laughs> 9 o'clock hour. Lisa Abramowitz on the break, looking at her L.L. Bean catalog, Freeport, Maine. Joining us now, the Camp Kotak Report, Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Fisherman. Uh, Cameron Dawson on earlier, showing the beast out of the water with Jim Bianco in the background. We thought we'd bring you on to give true American heritage. First of all, what are the size of the deer flies at Camp Kotak <laughs> in northern Maine? And they're not too bad. I mean, I did not go this year, uh, in all truth, uh, but uh, I imagine I was well represented by Cameron and Jim. Uh, but uh, the, the bugs are not too bad up there. Um, the, the debate that's had, and we make jokes about it, folks, and there, you know, there's a photo out on Twitter right now of the sturgeon that, that Cameron Dawson had caught here. But they're heated debates. Give us an example of the debate of all these smart people in a lodge after the third whiskey at 9 p.m. <laughs> I was going to say, <clears throat> the debates are quite serious, but after the third whiskey, they <laughs> may be a little bit less so. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about uh, interest rates in particular and, and where they're going to go and different mm -hmm. people's uh, views on that and then what policy should be. Uh, so it, it's, it's different every year. So we're uh, speaking with you ahead of a really uh, significant week, one of the big data points ahead of the Fed meeting in September, ahead of Jackson Hole coming up here later this month. We've got CPI on Thursday, PPI on Friday, also the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey with that inflation read. What are you watching most closely that could be the most forward-looking of indicators? Well, it's probably going to be the CPI, and it's going to be the month-over-month -month number because uh, we're going to see, <clears throat> due to base effects, headline number rise a little bit, and then... Uh, that'll probably get the focus for many of the headlines around the country, but I would imagine uh, that the Fed is more focused on the month over month. And if it comes in at two tenths as uh, forecast by the Bloomberg survey, that's a sign that we are seeing progress uh, and that inflation is continuing to slow down. And the Fed will take that as good news. But of course, they've got another CPI report before they get to the next monetary policy decision. Is it fair to say that we felt a shift recently where suddenly there is? an emphasis on holding and not on raising rates further, that suddenly it seems like that's Funny you kind of the that. push. Uh, John Williams is out this morning, the president of the New York Fed, with an interview in the New York Times with a former colleague, uh, Gina Smilek, where he says it is a question now of whether they actually do need <clears throat> to raise rates again. He says we're going to leave rates where they are for quite some time, uh, probably well into 2024. But <clears throat> do we need to raise right. rates again? And he, he said, uh, based on the data, he's seen, it's an open question. So given the yeah. fact that he's one of the big three on the uh, Open Market right. Committee, uh, people are paying attention to that. Quick here, as we get to Jackson Hole, you and I were weaned on Mutual of Omaha. Wild kingdom. We'd sit there at night and look at tigers and bears with Marlon, Marlon, Perkins. Marlon Perkins and the rest. The gentleman that ran Mutual of Omaha, Jeffrey Schmidt, will now run the Kansas City Fed. What does he bring there in bank supervision and examining what it's just the heritage of that Jackson Hole institution? Well, that's exactly what he brings, and it was kind of no surprise to see that that was his background because Tom Honig and then uh, <coughs> Esther George both came up as bank examiners. He started in Kansas City, but with the FDIC, but basically has spent his life in banking, except for that short period yeah. uh, in the insurance business. And so he uh, has a, a feel for what needs to be done right. uh, for banking. It'd be interesting to see where he comes down on, on regulations, but this adds another person who is going to have a bank background uh, with an idea on <clears throat> what they should be doing with regulations with Michael Barr's new uh, set of proposals. Mm. Uh, he'll join... Um, Mickey Bowman and Michael Barr right. as the as the bank uh, experts on the Fed. A Jackson Hole Wild Kingdom with Michael McKee. Look for that here uh, in a couple. There's of a weeks. moose. Lisa on the American economy. Uh, I, I think it's real simple as to say the biggest part of the algebraic function is the consumer, and our guest is the definitive on consumer dynamics. Which is really the key mystery point that people are trying to uh, hook into. So there is no one better to speak to than Michelle Meyer, who has grown up under Ethan Harris at Bank of America during the whole mortgage situation currently. Uh, Chief Economist for North America at the MasterCard Economics Institute. Michelle, always wonderful to see you. I want to start there. Are people overestimating or underestimating the strength of the consumer? 
Well, I think that was the story for the past year and a half has been this underestimation of the U.S. consumer. Um, the consumer has been able to spend. The consumer has been willing to spend. Um, the consumer has been eager <laughs> to engage in the economy and come back after this pandemic. Um, and you think about why. It's actually pretty simple. There's been a lot of purchasing power, whether it's the strength in the labor market that's continued. We saw that in Friday's jobs report. Or it's been the health of the balance sheet, um, which was, you know, really really um, improved in the pandemic period as households paid down their debt. Um, and even now in a higher rate environment, debt service ratios are still um, fairly reasonable and kind of back to where we were prior to the pandemic. That higher. said, that said, you have seen a decrease in income relative to spending. In other words, people are spending more than they're bringing in at this point. And a lot of it has to do with credit cards. They're increasing the amount of revolving debt, credit card debt uh, that, they're, that they have outstanding. How long can that continue? Well, the way I think about it is throughout last year when we had high inflationary environment, it was certainly the case that consumers were augmenting their income with other sources, whether that's drawing down savings or taking on more debt. Um, and that was to help support the inflationary environment. But now inflation is a lot more subdued. So if you look at real wages or real purchasing power, it has certainly turned positive where consumers now have a lot of support from, simply from the labor market and they don't necessarily need that same buffer that they needed when they were facing such high inflation. No doubt it just puts out on, is it Twitter? Are we call it something different now? Is it X? The, the X platform e? formerly known as Twitter. The platform formerly known as Twitter. And he does what I like to do, which is take three months data, 90 days of data, and annualize it. And the real GDP statistic, the cons American consumer statistic looking three months back, is extraordinary. It's a 5.3 percent uh, number. That's just absolutely stunning as well. Does your consumer data at MasterCard validate a resiliency to that ginormous 5.3 percent trend? Yeah, you guys are throwing out all my old colleagues, Ethan, Neil. <laughs> it's a party here. Um, Ethan, but, who? <laughs> Ethan. <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> tell me, tell me about so real GDP consumer. now. Has it got some persistency? Yeah, um, I think it does. I mean, if you look at the first half of the year and you think about GDP growth and consumer spending, even measures of business investment, um, it's been above expectations, which is partly, I think, because expectations were set too low, but also showed a consumer that does have this persistence. Look, the consumer is shifting. The economy is shifting. We're entering a different stage in this business cycle. Um, it is a stage where there's more of a moderation, there's more of a normalization. There's still debate of what trend growth is or potential growth is coming out of the pandemic. But it's not an economy that is moving towards you know, a, a proper deceleration, which was the fear of a lot of people earlier in the year. So given that, mm -hmm. do you stand on the side of soft landing or do you, side, is on the side, uh, do you stand on the side where we're underestimating how much strength there is and how much potential for inflation to keep going at really elevated levels. So we've been in the soft landing camp, and I, I still hold to that view. And I think when you think about soft, there's going to be bumps. <laughs> and for certain sectors, it could look bumpier than others, right? When you think about the manufacturing sector, that's struggling a bit more. When you think about housing, which was in a big adjustment throughout this year, and this year is actually reaccelerating, which is somewhat problematic for the Federal Reserve. Um, but yeah, it does seem like this is an economy that's readjusting, and it's doing so in a way that has been a lot less... Um, problematic than I think people feared. We were talking earlier with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley and talking about the fiscal impulse and that was been one of the drivers of the strength that we've seen, the resilience, this belief in a soft landing that we have currently in the market. How much do you lean into that, that what we're seeing, the strength of the consumer, the strength of the economy has been driven entirely by fiscal spending that has been delayed and has really come into effect after the pandemic was over? Well, look, there was an extraordinary amount of fiscal and monetary stimulus that boosted the economy. So when I think about the stages, you had a pandemic that created an abrupt shutdown of the economy, a reopening stage that was hot. The economy was red hot because you had this pent up demand, fiscal stimulus, monetary policy. Um, and now we're in a stage where the economy is creating more of a, of a normalization, a rebalancing, an adjustment, pick your phrase. Um, but... I, 
whichever way you cut it, um, I think there is still some support from the stimulus that we had um, enjoyed. And that could be from the consumer with a household balance sheet that's been in, in improved, or it could even be part of the manufacturing right. sector when you think about the infrastructure spending that's going through the economy now, which is quite important. Without giving away the, the crown jewels, you at MasterCard have incredible consumer data. Is there resistance to 29 or 30 percent credit card interest rates? Do people go, no, I don't want to do that? Well, you know, we're every we're kind of the economy in general is figuring out what that level of interest rates is that is in a, a challenge, right? So when you think about the Fed bringing interest rates close to six percent on the policy rate, beginning of this cycle, there was a view that was impossible. You can't have a six percent policy rate, and the economy will break right. under that environment, and it hasn't because you also have to think about it in terms of real rates, not just that nominal rate. Um, so that, I think, is what the Fed is trying to engineer and figure out is what is the level of interest rates that's the appropriate level that doesn't cause the economy to roll over but does cause the economy to slow down because that moderation is important. It's uh, part of getting Well, very stable. quickly here, and you mentioned Neil Dutt earlier and all yeah. that you did at Bank of America with Dr. Harris. Ethan Harris is re retiring. Yes. And I would suggest what Ethan Harris gave you, which is a sense of look at history. And yeah. the answer is where we are now is where we were. I'll let you decide. Where are we? Early 2000s? Is this a 90s analog that we're in right now? I mean, um, so, yes, Ethan, time series, that's his thing. Yeah. That's been huge. <laughs> I'd still bring that back. Um, in terms of the comparison, you know, it'd be great if it was a 90s comparison because that was a cycle that enjoyed productivity gains. It was a cycle that had a lot longer duration than anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fed was able to hike rates and then gradually normalize or reduce interest rates without creating a huge business cycle. Um, so there's a lot of parallels to that. Um, but it's hard to just take this business cycle and fit it into a box or say this is exactly like this right. past cycle because it was a pandemic with extraordinary stimulus. So, so much has changed. Think about the structure of the labor market, how much that has changed with a more hybrid right. workforce. Think about how much we've embraced technology. There's a lot that is well, different about this economy. It'd be great to get you, Neil Dudd, and Ethan Harris on the desk at the same time, although folks are not in speaking terms. No, so don't no, look no, for no, that. no. Michelle Meyer with us <laughs> with MasterCard Economics Institute. How could anyone not well. be in speaking terms with, with Michelle Meyer? That's are you true. kidding? <laughs> Give me a That's break. True. Well, start with me. Um, <laughs> Standard <laughs> Poor's 500, it is up three tenths of a percent. We are seeing, Tom, a, a trickle of earnings this week after the bonanza <clears> that we saw last week and the week before. But some of them are kind of interesting in light of what we've been talking about. Tyson, we mentioned that earlier, the chicken plant uh, processor, they actually came out with pretty negative earnings. They had a, a negative look forward. They're shutting four additional chicken facilities, given that sales is trailing estimates. On the margins, there are areas of weakness in this rolling recession, and it's interesting to see yeah. how they're kind of coming to the fore and how, you know, really it is a stock-selecting kind of market when it, when you look at the actual performance. I, I was weaned on Tyson's Foods by the great John Beerbussy, who was a terrific securities analyst of the old school at A.G. Edwards. And I totally take your point that you always have to pay attention to what Tyson's is doing and meat processing. The way I would look at it, this weekend, I said, you know, I'm going to go large. I'm going to get the offspring. This is afterthought, back from camp, you know, the shock. So I said, I'm going to get her a real steak. I hadn't bought a fancy piece of steak at Whole Paycheck like I did this weekend. I could not believe the price of cow at the store. Well, I was that's, stunned. that's one side of things. <clears throat> On the Tyson side of things, the price for pork going down. The price for chicken going down. We talk yeah. about how inflation supports revenues, deflation the other way around. Exactly. And that, I think, is something that's understated in this sort of, you yeah. know, bizarre mix that we have here in the post-pandemic economy. Across this summer and into fall, we'll stay with these larger trends in the American economy, including, and I'm in Lisa's camp here, I think deflation is something we're going to talk to Jackson Hole and beyond as well. Green on the screen, Michelle Meyer driving the equity market higher. Dow Jones Industrial Average up 88 points. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
not terribly optimistic that we will get this true soft landing. It might look that way for a couple months and the data will obviously get CPI this week and that will look softer again. We had a very strong, still strong jobs report on Friday. Um, but I think we're really less optimistic that this will end well um, and that inflation will come back sustainably to 2% without some bigger downturn. Um, it just depends on when we get that. Veronica Clark, Citigroup. Andrew Hollenhorst out right after that with a statement there on resi resiliency. Tom Keen, Lisa Bramowitz uh, here. John Farrell getting ready for the next hour. And Lisa, just real simple here. They retain a higher rate view. They just simply, Citigroup just simply will not give it up. A lot of people <laughs> won't give it up. They have been right, though, for a lot of the uh, a lot of the year, really pushing back against what some people are Excuse saying. Me. The question is whether dis the disinflation that we're seeing now is lasting or is transitory, whether we're going to end up with higher oil prices, whether we're going to end up with wages that fuel gains elsewhere. How do you get disinflation <coughs> with a strong consumer and a robust economy? It's going to, it's going to be interesting and to see. And again, I'm, I'm much better than I was last week, folks. But thanks for the many notes on the plague uh, that's out there. And, you know, I'm getting over it. I'm, you know what I'm drinking? But tang Ch cherry? No, not tang. I, I I had to cut back on the tang. They, okay. the, the doctor said you just get too much. It's like twelve glasses of water a day. Don't do it. Tart cherry juice is what they recommended. Really? Yeah. For what? My bronchial mm, okay. well-being. Do you like it? Is it yummy? It's yummy. Yeah, it's it's okay. I get used to it. Okay, good. You know, the shot of gin with it helps out, <laughs> as you can imagine. Right now, we are going to gin up a story here on Goldman Sachs. Yes, it's about Jeff Curry leaving, head of commodities, a former professor at Chicago, microeconomics. But it's far, far more on that. And I want to go to a story from six days ago. Goldman Sachs, family office partner, a poku to leave, because maybe that's a bigger story. Srinata Rajan, for all of Global uh, Wall Street, is expert on this, and he joins us and reports this morning. I'm sorry, there's something going on here. Don't give me your, well, we don't know, it's just speculation, baloney. They're walking out the door, aren't they? So let's start with some numbers. Uh, this Jeff Curry would perhaps be the sixth partner to leave in the last couple of weeks. In late July, early August, that's not the usual time when you see a lot of partners leave. To me, it still feels like Jeff Curry's departure might be slightly different from some of the other recent departures we've seen, the likes of Lisa Poku, the likes of Julian Salisbury. These were some of the people who were on the up and up. For them to leave was a surprising bit. We have to remember, and over the years, this is what Goldman has told us, to maintain their pool of 400 or so partners every couple of years, some 35, uh, some 70 partners leave. More recently, a new spokesman has said that's about 80 partners every two years. So there's clearly been some inflation in that figure. But the fact of the matter is, there's always a bunch of, to put it politely, undesirables in the Goldman partner ranks. They don't get fired, but they're certainly shown the door. They walk out, they're tired, they leave. But what has been surprising in the last year, in the last 18 months, in fact, in the last couple of years, is the type of partners leaving, people who were picked for better roles, people who were picked for much greater things at Goldman, deciding to walk right. out the door because of some of the issues that firm is in facing. In the delicacies of this, and Shri's going to be reporting on this for Global Wall Street through all of today and into tomorrow, what's the why? What is the set of whys, if you will, this is going on? That's not going on at Morgan Stanley, right? It, it, we certainly haven't seen anything of this space at any other firm. It, it's, it's fair to say that there is a bit of tumult in the higher ranks of Goldman. There's, there's no denying that. He, he, are, are, are the rank and file big fans of the CEO, David Solomon? You, even David Solomon would probably tell you that's not true. The reasons for that are perhaps debatable. You have come off a great high of 2021 only to see profits and earnings just completely get decimated in 22, fall further in 23. That could be a factor. There are others who would say there are strategic missteps and there are others who say that this CEO just does not inspire faith. Is there a certain area of the company where a lot of the departures are focused, a certain type of asset class, a certain type of uh, practice? I think we should acknowledge it front on that we don't have full visibility into all the partner departures. What we do see is some of the prominent names who leave. That is why people inside the firm, people outside the firm, talk to us about those departures because these are names that are recognizable. It's hard to draw statistics from that. We do know that their banking and trading business has been doing quite well. That has always been the crown jewel of Goldman Sachs. That has done really well. Unfortunately for David Solomon, he can't take a lot of credit for that because that was already doing really well. The kind of areas he tried to drive the firm into, consumer banking, turned out to be a major flop. 
And that unfortunately sits on his head. If you take a step back, it seems as though there are a number of sort of big seismic changes in the banking industry. There's Credit Suisse that has gone gone away, uh, UBS uh, acquiring, not gone away yet, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, you have a real kind of shifting in the baton with respect to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, or at least people are thinking about that. Where does Goldman Sachs fit into this, especially at a time of very much a talent war? I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because Goldman criminology aside, forget the palace intrigue at Goldman Sachs, the changes, the structural changes we've seen in the global banking industry, you know, what has happened with the big European banks has meant that if you are a large U.S. bank, if you've been doing well and you have a strong presence in what you're doing, you will gain market share. The competitive moat around the likes of J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Stanley, and Goldman Sachs continues to grow, continues to become deeper. So they have benefited from that. Given that, where has Goldman Sachs not benefited to the extent where people are seeing an opportunity to leave, perhaps to go somewhere else that is benefiting or perhaps to go off on their own? Well, 20 years ago, if the bank was performing as well as it is performing right now, you would have made a lot more money. That's not the case anymore. And the opportunities on the buy side that kind of money Goldman Sachs just oh, cannot on. throw at its top executives. Okay. And loyalty is just not such a binding I, factor anymore. I, I'm not going to mince words here. Private equity is taking over the Srinatarajan Act. Dr. Curry is worth his weight in gold to some private equity shop, right? Well, you, you've seen a prominent move like that. Remember Torsten Slock, who's now at Apollo? He moved from the sell side to the buy side. We don't know what Jeff Curry is doing. It right. would appear that he is taking some time out, spending some time with family. He has two young kids, <coughs> so he could potentially be taking some time. He's just 56, so it's hard to say that he's, he's retiring. He's, he's for old. Good. He's ancient. You nailed it this morning. You said that Jeff Curry was tired of waiting. Tired of waiting for you. Yeah, that was you, Tom, and that was you. That was <laughs> you finding the you Explain, Explain fandom Dr. for the king. Curry, yeah. <laughs> finance and Ray Davies' latest move. So, is, 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 at least with Jeff Curry, you know about his uh, part-time job, which is a little bit of commodities research. But he's perhaps more famous for, at least we'd like to think, for helping produce a movie, a documentary on on this journalist trying to reunite the king some forty years after those guys broke up. I love that. And I've got to say that I love that you tried to put the song into Shree's mouth, basically saying you came here singing. Uh, when you look forward, the people you talk to, and you do have a lot of sources, are there more to come? Yes, unfortunately, it doesn't look like this is something that's going to stop. It, it, again, the, the, the people exiting Goldman Sachs is the number of people, you want to keep a track on that, but there isn't anything in that quantity that suggests that's a <clears throat> problem. What we want to see is the type of people leaving the building. Shri, very quickly here, it's August, but it doesn't feel like August to me on New York Wall Street. It feels like late October. Bonus season, February, they're doing fiscal planning for next year. McKinsey-like, larger 60,000, baloney. It's out the window. This seems to be a unique August. How unique is this August for the players in Manhattan? It's, it's very important. You've had five very slow months, six very slow months, seven very slow months to start the year. Sorry, I was just trying to figure out where July falls yeah. in the calendar. But you. you've had seven slow months to start the year. The question is now when we're seeing a little bit of a pickup, we head into the late summer lull. You're hoping for a pickup <clears> after Labor Day, but then that giant uh, right. U.S. government shutdown threats start coming into the fray again start of October, and then you're close okay. to the end of the year. So is there enough time to rebound? Ten seconds. David from the Hamptons emails in, goes, when's Shri publishing this morning? What are you publishing this morning? Nothing did. else for now, Tom. <laughs> I <laughs> gave you my story for the day. Okay, David, there you go. Shri will be publishing later today, we believe. Shri Natarajan with us, Bloomberg News, uh, Dr. Curry and others exiting. <laughs> I love that. I was on edge of Shanali Basak there. I was thinking of getting into it. <laughs> Honestly, this is a real big question, though, as you do see this global sea change in uh, the banking system. Mm. Who's benefiting? And then if you do have the increase in the prominence of some of the private equity firms, how much does that really amp up the talent wars in a new way, which have yeah. already really seen this over the past decade or so? The key thing Sri said there is it's been slow for X number of months. Never forget this. There's a whole set of variable costs on global Wall Street, which are really fixed costs. And they're sitting there right now going, what do we do about our fixed cost obligation, including the fixed cost of all that personnel? Are you uh, as well. calling for job cuts? Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> no, I just we've been there, done that. Speaking of been there, done that, 1 p.m. this afternoon to save the network.
Kathy Wood, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer at ARC Investment Management, a well-timed ETF discussion. Thanks to our team, thanks to our interns for putting it together this Monday.